And this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> uh, Z and I will be your hosts today. Unfortunately, Jessie is not able to make it. She had a prior commitment, and we wanted to make sure to get this on the books before things got wildly out of control for your semesters or whatever else was going on in your lives. So uh, Jessie won't be here, but you've got me and Z. So we're going to be running the show. And today we are talking about SAV restoration. The emphasis will not be on Zostra. I know a lot of us work on Zostra, uh, but we are trying to emphasize that, you know, there are other species along the, the Mid-Atlantic and Upper East Coast that, you know, range from freshwater to out to the salty waters. And uh, we want to give them a little attention too. So uh, with that, if I haven't met you, uh, my name is Brooke Landry. I'm with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the Chesapeake Bay Program. Down here, I run the SAV work group, and uh, a lot of y'all have been peppered with, you know, materials from our SAV work group. So uh, if you ever have any questions about anything we've put out there, let me know. And with that, I'll pass it on to Z to introduce herself. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Elizabeth or Z Lacey at Stockton University in, in New Jersey. I run the SAV monitoring program here in the, in the marine botanist. And so I'm just gonna use the names in the chat and go down that list. So if you haven't already put your name there, please do. Uh, first up, we've got Becky. Hey, afternoon, everybody. Becky Golden with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and also the vice chair for the Chesapeake Bay Programs SAV work group. Thank you, Kayla. I don't know which. Kayla, oh, right. We I, have two. We'll <laughs> go with Kayla C and then we'll go with Kayla K. I just noticed that. I was muted anyway. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Kayla C. I am with Delaware's Department of Natural um, Resources and Environmental Control, and I am um, one of the Delaware Steering Committee representatives for this group. Hi, everyone. Great. Thanks, Kayla. And then Kayla S. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Kayla Sullivan. I work for EPA Region 2's Long Island Sound Office where I am our EPA lead for habitat and porting. Thank you, Morgan. Hi, Morgan Jones here uh, with KCI Technologies and just a very passionate SAV volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Next, Taylor. Hi, I'm Taylor Hoffman. I'm working with the Delaware Center for the Inland Bays as their science coordinator. Welcome, Gabriella. Hi, Gabby Velotti, also with Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. Welcome, Cheyenne. Hi everyone, Cheyenne Adams with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. I manage the marine vegetation mapping program that um, delineates seagrasses and salt marshes on the Maine coast. Thanks. Stacy. Hi, everyone. I'm Stacey Jong. I'm a professor at NC State University, and I serve as one of the steering committee members for the North Carolina representatives. Great. Paige. Hi, my name is Paige Hoba. Um, I am with Tetra Tech, um, located in Owings Mills, Maryland, and I work on some Chesapeake Bay program or Chesapeake Bay related SAV stuff. I'm just here to listen in, see what's going on. <laughs> Welcome, Paige. Trevor. Hey, all. Trevor Matera, uh, Habitat Program Manager with the Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership of New Hampshire and Southern Maine. Hey, uh, Della. Hi, I'm Della. I'm uh, the Seagrass Coordinator with uh, New York Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, Jill. Afternoon, everyone. Jill Carr, Mass Bay's National Estuary Partnership in UMass Boston. Aaron. Hi, everybody. With Acorn and a private consultant based out of Silver Spring, Maryland, and I'm a diehard SAB enthusiast. Really Ooh, choppy so there, Aaron. We have three Aarons. We do have three Aarons. Wild. Aaron Riley, you're next, right? <laughs> <laughs> useful names. Aaron Riley, 
if you're still there, unmute. Did we lose her? I don't see your name up there anymore. Maybe we'll come back. Um, Aaron is the uh, restoration coordinator at the Chesapeake Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve in Virginia. And me, Aaron, are the, <laughs> uh, run the SAB program at the reserve. And we are located at BEMS. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron, for doing double duty there. Yeah. Um, Mike, one of our presenters today. Michael Norman should be able to. Oh, you're muted. There okay. you go. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Norman. I am the lab manager for the biology department and the environmental center at Anne Arundel Community College. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chris. Hi, everybody. Uh, Chris Patrick. I'm a professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And I'm the director of the SAV Restoration and Monitoring Program here at BIMS uh, and servicing the Chesapeake Bay, the Maryland, and the Virginia Coastal Bays in our aerial surveys. Thank you. Nina? Hi, everyone. Nina Kolajiovanni with New Jersey DEP Fish and Wildlife Bureau of Marine Habitat and Shelf Fisheries. Welcome. Oh, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Scowen, and I work with Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Thank you. Matthew. Hi, everyone. I am a PhD student at the University of Connecticut, working in Dr. Jamie Faudry's lab, as well as collaborating with the Connecticut National Estuary Research Reserve. Welcome, Matt. Tay? Hi, everyone. It's great to see so many people here. Um, I am a longtime seagrass enthusiast, um, and I'm right now working at MassDEP, um, managing the uh, Wetland Resource Area Mapping Program, which includes um, eelgrass mapping, um, as well as policy and guidance and regulatory reviews. Quite a mouthful right there. <laughs> uh, Emily. As long as there's no other Emily's, um, <laughs> I, there's usually more. So um, I'm Emily. I work. I'm a graduate student at UConn in Baudry Lab, and then I'm also uh, work on the Eelgrass Collaborative with the Connecticut National Estuary and Research Reserve. So great. Let's see, Katie. Hi, everyone. Katie Lund. I also work at the Connecticut National Estuary Research Reserve. I'm the coastal training uh, coordinator there, and I'm helping to facilitate a similar collaborative effort um, on a smaller scale, the Long Island Sound Eogras Collaborative. So we're here kind of learning where the overlap is today. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, Rachel? Hi, Rachel Gitman. I'm an assistant professor at East Carolina University in the Department of Biology and the Coastal Studies Institute and um, dabble in experimental restoration, um, mostly in marshes and oysters, but have been doing some seagrass work as well in coastal North Carolina. So here to learn. Welcome, welcome. And last, Katya, another of our speakers. Hi, I'm Katya Engelhart. I'm with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science Appalachian Lab in Frostburg. This is up in the Appalachian Mountains, and I'm here as a research associate professor. Great. Welcome, welcome to everybody. Um, as as we've mentioned, Brooks mentioned as well, you know, this collaborative really is the effort of everything that we can put into it. And on the webpage, you're going to find a lot of resources and some of the other groups that are starting up different types of COPs. We're trying to find a home for them on the webpage. When we sent out this meeting announcement, I do want to draw your attention to the Sentinel site report. Um, so that was brought together based on our meeting back in July to kind of collate all the information that we went through. We did a survey, compiled the results from that, and we're looking for some feedback. And then that document will also be posted on the website. It's kind of like if you need the agenda for this meeting, if you are looking for documents, the website, Caitlin's done a really great job of um, getting that up and running and, and uh, contributing as well as our member spotlight. So you can learn a bit more about each of the members um, here within our, our collaborative. So thank you again all for being here. Uh, we have three panel presentations lined up for today. The goal is to, to discuss, as Brooke mentioned, SAV restoration. 
Um, so first up will be Chris uh, talking about his work there at VIMS, then Michael Norman with Anna and Rundell Community College, and then Katya will be talking about her work at UMC's um, with restoration. So we have slated about 15 minutes for each of the presentations and then a discussion period afterwards, and then potentially going into breakout rooms based on your interest. So if you're more of a newbie in terms of restoration and wanna be in a, in a group of, of folks asking questions about how to get started. And then we have kind of an old timer room set, a st set up for discussing potential issues. Given that this is the collaborative and, and we want it to be steered by your interest, we also um, can nix that idea and continue on with a discussion after our presentations as well. So that's just kind of what it looks like for the first um, little bit of our schedule. You should have, everyone should have received the agenda for today. Um, and that's what that looks like here. It's just our panel presentations. Um, whether or not we then go into those breakout rooms, like I said, we've got some, um, some wiggle room to move with. Um, the second part of our, our conversation today will involve the regulatory aspects for restoration. I know for a lot of us, particularly if we're looking at doing seed-based restoration, maybe moving seeds between states, um, what collection procedures look like, regulations, state, uh, federal-wise, there's a lot of questions that we have, and Becky has all the answers, <laughs> um, but we're hoping to learn a little bit about what what um, regulatory processes are out there, as well as um, one of the publications that the Chesapeake Bay Working Group has is a table involving a lot of the different um, state statutes um, on, on restoration, so we're going to look at that as well. So that's just kind of a game plan for today, um, starting with those. If there's any other kind of comments or thoughts before we get going? There are some folks that are on the meeting that did not get called for an introduction. Okay. Did I? They haven't, they, well, they haven't put their info in the chat, but okay. we, <laughs> we can put them on the spot or if they're trying to say incognito, that's okay too. But we do have Madison, Forrest, Eric, and Courtney and Cynthia on. Oh. So if any, if any of you all would like to come off mute and introduce yourselves, we can start with Madison. Um, I'm Madison Lytle. I'm a PhD candidate at UNC Wilmington under Dr. Jesse Jarvis, and we do some um, drone mapping of our seagrass meadows. So excited to hear about some restoration topics today. Great. Thanks, Madison. Do you want to go next, Eric? Sure. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Sorry for being a little late. I'm Eric Schneider. I'm with uh, Rhode Island's Department of Environmental Management's Division of Marine Fisheries. Thanks, Eric. Cynthia? Do you want to go next? Sure. I'm uh, hi everybody. I'm Cynthia Hayes. I'm a professor at Keene State College. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how about Courtney Schmidt? Hi all, Courtney Schmidt. I'm the staff scientist with the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program. Thank you. And then Forrest. Hi, nice to see everybody. I'm Forrest Shank, uh, Masters of Division of Marine Fisheries. Great. Thank you. Is there anybody else that we missed that wants to say hi? I think that's everybody. <laughs> like Thanks for said. tracking that. Yep. Uh, the windows bounce around. Okay. I think that's it. I, I think we're ready to go. We can start with our presentations. So that that's you, Chris. Do you want to share your screen? I can do a little intro for Chris. He introduced himself earlier, but... He is the, uh, the director of the SAV Monitoring and Mapping Pro and Restoration Program at Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is an organization uh, entity that is attached to William & Mary down in Virginia. And Chris and I have worked together for years. Excellent presenter. Excited to hear you talk about restoration. Thanks, well, Chris. Thanks, Brooke. Um, can yeah. everybody see my screen and also hear me okay? Yes, you're yes. good to go. All right. Um, so this talk is entitled Successes, Failures, and Lessons Learned Through Grass Restoration in the Mid-Atlantic in the Context of a Changing World. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, our dominant seagrass historically has been eelgrass, and the coverage of eelgrass in the bay has declined a lot uh, since uh, historic times, at least over the last century. Um, so this figure on the left shows how much of a contraction we've seen up to present. Now it actually was worse um, in the uh, uh, 1970s. And from the period when we started monitoring from 1984 to the mid nineties, 
uh, zoster uh, was actually increasing. Um, so we've got a uh, general increase um, during this time period. Uh, but then we started having um, declines again. Um, and we've been declining slowly, that's this blue line here, um, since that period up until now. And the reason this has been happening is because our summer temperatures have been increasing and we've been having heat stress dieback events. And the combination of low water clarity and high temperatures for Zostra in this region of the world uh, is kind of a death sentence. Uh, so what can we do about it? Um, well, there's the big thing. We can enhance water quality and light to support seagrass health. Health, we can um, do restoration um, in places where we don't have grass, but the conditions seem appropriate. And when we have these climate uh, concerns, I mean, the three things that people have been talking about are introducing new taxa into these systems, um, uh, introducing climate resilient genes into these systems, and then maybe using other native taxa that we've overlooked in the past. Um, and so today I'm really going to be focusing on this third bit um, and also talk a little bit about condition and how that's still important. Um, and I just want to point out that these other two items are things that uh, folks at VIMS and other folks in the collaborative are considering um, and looking at. So there's a lot of research that's happening in this topic in general. Um, and I would be um, uh, remiss to, to not point out that I'm, we've been doing a lot of restoration. And I know that we're not supposed to talk about eelgrass, but I was going to just point out that one of the big successes of our program has been the restoration of uh, eelgrass to the Virginia Coastal Lagoons. So that project, which started around uh, 2000, has resulted in the most successful seagrass restoration in the world. Uh, and it really demonstrates, uh, if nothing else, that you can restore seagrass meadows in a very short time period um, if the conditions are right. Um, and it can be really cost effective uh, if, if you're if you're doing it right. Uh, we were seeing 15 acres for every acre that's been planted. And that project's actually continuing. So we're now working uh, further up the coast in uh, an area called Burton's Bay, uh, the Virginia Coastal Lagoons. And um, this past fall, we planted 80 acres of eelgrass, which is a kind of a record for us. Um, and so that's a big effort that we're uh, working on. And I consider this one of our big successes. Um, however, in the Chesapeake, where eelgrass is stressed out, it doesn't really make as much sense to be doing lots of eelgrass plantings using the same stock that's suffering under climate change. But we've seen this big explosion of wigeon grass in recent years, and wigeon grass is a lot more uh, temperature resistant. Um, and so this is something that we've started considering um, as an alternative or complementary species to be planting. So some differences between uh, wigeon grass and rupia is that uh, uh, sorry, wigeon grass and, and uh, zostera um, is that, you know, wigeon grass is short. It has less biomass per unit area than eelgrass. As I mentioned, it's tolerant to high temperatures, though, and it's got this very hardy and long-lived seed bed. We've also found that it has different um, habitat um, uh, benefits. So it really has a lot more epifauna per unit volume of grass than, than eelgrass, uh, but it's a different suite of species. Uh, you've got a lot more caprellids and small amphipods, things like that. They're using this habitat um, and less of the larger taxa. And so our thought was that wigeon grass can help support zostera and that mixed seagrass uh, meadows might be more stable over time. So doing not just zostera plantings here, but also mixing wigeon grass into our plantings might have uh, greater success in the long term. And so two of the big questions we were asking are, well, can we restore wigeon grass at scale? And what are the best practices for doing so? And so the example that I'm gonna talk about is work that we've been doing in collaboration with CB Mears um, uh, and funded by the US Army Corps of Engineers to uh, try to bring SAV back to a system called Broad Bay in the Lynn Haven River system kind of near Virginia Beach. So this system had uh, pretty good coverage of SAV in the mid eighties, um, but 2019, there really isn't any grass in the system other than this very small little patch of wigeon grass that popped up uh, here. So we, we've had a pretty large decline in grass um, and this decline really kind of set in 15 years ago and uh, has been persistent ever since. However, um, anecdotally, people have been saying that water quality conditions in the system have improved due to updates to uh, wastewater management systems and, and other kinds of things like that. 
uh, a cursory summary of CV Near's uh, data flow data from the mid 2000s period to recent suggests that there might be some truth to that. It looks like oxygen concentrations have gone up a bit. Turbidity and chlorophyll concentrations have gone down a bit. Um, but we've also seen uh, some increases in summertime temperatures as well. Um, so can we bring SAV back to the system through restoration? Uh, well, the first thing that we were looking at was, well, how is the best way to collect and process wood and grass seeds at scale? And so we decided to try out what we basically already do for Zostera, but just trying it on witch and grass. And so we were doing collections in July and early August. We found that July is more productive um, than, than August uh, for, for this region. That's when we get the most seeds per unit volume. We bring these things back in um, uh, big laundry bags full of reproductive shoots, and we put them in tanks. And, um, and, and part of our process is we try to volumetrically measure all the material we're bringing back so that we can get an idea of uh, how many seeds we're getting per unit volume of material. Um, we separate this stuff from the organics after it's all settled out and released, and then we start doing quality assessment. And one of our big questions we had uh, from the get-go was, we sort zoster seeds based on fall velocity using the flume shown on the left. Can we do that with widgeon grass? Is that a useful way to uh, do a first pass cut, getting rid of the bad seeds? Um, what we found is that not really. Um, we really don't want to toss any of the widgeon grass seeds. Uh, fluming doesn't seem to uh, have a lot of value. Uh, however, there is some value in looking at uh, fall velocity rates uh, to come up with some uh, basically proportions of good seeds to bad seeds. You can see that we have a higher proportion of good seeds at the higher fall velocities, but there's still lots of good seeds at the low fall velocities. Um, we've also found uh, in some lab experiments that uh, you know, these seeds do best when they're stored um, in cold conditions for at least three months. Uh, that's when we start getting uh, relatively high germination rates, once we put them into uh, uh, appropriate conditions. So that was the first set of questions that we had. The next question was, well, when should we be putting these out if we're going to do broadcast seeding, which we've been, we found to be the most effective way to do large-scale restoration. And so we, we ran an experiment um, in this system looking at uh, planting in the fall, planting in the spring, and then also looking at uh, spring freshwater shock, uh, which the literature suggests is a, a natural germination um, IQ when you get a lot of freshwater input. Um, and so we had these, uh, this uh, factorial design. Uh, 500 seeds per plot, and we also put in uh, eelgrass seeds as a comparison point. And uh, what we found um, is that in terms of area per plot that's covered and shoot density per plot, in, in both cases, uh, putting stuff out in the fall um, seemed like the simplest thing. So the, the freshwater shock and uh, just putting stuff out in the spring didn't seem to be super effective. We had a lot lower establishment in terms of area and shoot density. Um, and the freshwater shock actually was was not a good thing because if those uh, seeds start germinating before we put them out, uh, they don't even really settle properly and they get washed out. So, um, so the best thing to be doing is to just get those things out there in the fall um, and let them naturally experience and condition over the winter temperatures and experience natural fresh freshets in the spring and germinate as they usually would, uh, which makes everything simpler and easier. So we, uh, we planted in the fall of 2021, a larger scale, two acres uh, of some Zostra and also Wigeon grass. Uh, this is what it looked like from aerial imagery in May of 2022. Uh, so you see we have uh, meadows half established here. Uh, mission accomplished, right? We, uh, we did it. Um, and then based on the success, we made plans to do additional planting in these sort of large scale uh, one acre plots uh, shown here and then zoomed in here. Uh, with uh, widgeon grass inshore and eelgrass offshore, uh, and then also test plots in some other areas we're looking at. However, um, the story doesn't end there. So this is the area that we originally planted, and these are the areas that we're looking at for the target plantings. Um, we, for our one acre um, plots, I sort of explained again that we have these uh, zostera and then widgeon grass. And then for all these dots, these are small pairs of one meter square test plots. So uh, Zostra and Rupia planted side by side. In May of 2023, everything was looking pretty good. Um, in fact, some of our establishment rates 
uh, we're, we're quite high. I mean, we're at 20% cover already, which is great. Uh, that, that's an excellent uh, sort of early stage outcome for uh, some of these plots. Uh, and we had reasonable uh, establishment and percent cover in the, in the, in the subplots. Uh, anything over 10%, we think is pretty good. You, you'll note that the, the widgeon grass cover is lower than the zostra. And part of that is just because it's kind of a very thin, shrimpy little uh, SAV. Uh, but uh, again, we were getting establishment. It looked like things were doing okay. Um, and similar results here for uh, for shoot counts in May of 2023. Um, but then let's talk about failure. Uh, so here's what they looked like in September of 2023. There's nothing. There's no uh, visible shoots anymore. Uh, there's there's no leaves that we could see in any of these plots. Uh, we did see some rhizomes in in the plots in the large plots that were uh, did not look like they were dead. Um, and so there's a possibility that maybe some new leaves will come up in the fall, and we're going to reassess that in April. Uh, but generally speaking, this was a very poor outcome. And when we look at our uh, one meter squared plots in these other areas, we have the same issue, right? So we couldn't find any grass. It looked like um, these plots all failed over the course of the summer. Um, some work by CB Mears going back to the original site um, at the end of the summer in 2023 uh, found that there were still some zostra from the original uh, experiment that we did. So there's some zostra still hanging on, um, but uh, a lot of this plot had also disappeared. So what happened? Um, so these data are from uh, CB Nears, our, our partner on the project. And, and what they're showing is that, you know, by um, early summer, we're getting light attenuation um, that is uh, poor. Um, and then we're also getting water temperatures that are, are bad for zostra um, in this system by midsummer. Um, and met, like I mentioned before, the combination of poor water clarity and high temperatures is really, really bad for Zostra. Um, and we see the same sort of pattern uh, with the turbidity uh, data as well. So we've got a water quality issue that's, that's present here. We also see really heavy epiphyte loads on these grasses. I mean, just thick mats of, of algae growing on these things, which is uh, perhaps doing even more damage in terms of light interception. Um, and we also, during this period, we had some natural establishment of beds. For example, this is a rupia meadow that showed up. We had nothing to do with it uh, in the system in May of 2022. Pretty expansive, looks pretty good. Uh, and in May of 2023, we don't see any uh, widgeon grass there at all. And there's been some anecdotal reports that um, Countos rays are uh, part of the issue, that there is some heavy foraging uh, in this area that, 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 that did a lot of damage. Um, so what we can draw from this is that we have com near complete loss of the SAV in the system. And the only thing that seemed to survive were the eelgrass that were transplanted as whole shoots three years earlier as part of um, uh, a sort of a test case experiment. We know that water clarity was poor for much of the summer. We know that the temperatures were higher than uh, what we'd like to see for eelgrass for a good chunk of the summer. We know that the epiphyte loads were really high. Um, and also, the widgeon grass meadows were not planted as shallow as they could have been planted uh, because we were um, stuck working within lease boundaries um, that, that the contract uh, holder um, had negotiated. So we had to go a little deeper than we would have liked to. Um, speculating here, the eelgrass probably survived the transplanted eelgrass because it had had enough of an establishment period and it came with rhizomes that it had deeper carbohydrate reserves that would let it get over that hump. Eelgrass can actually be pretty resilient uh, to low water clarity if it's got enough uh, sugar stores built up. Um, and so what can we learn from all this? Well, one, I don't wanna discount the fact that we've shown that widgeon grass can be successfully established um, at scale through seed collection, collection and uh, broadcasting methods. So that is, um, I think, a major accomplishment, um, but, you know, while widgeon grass is resistant to temperature stress, making it at face value a desirable alternative to eelgrass, it's, it's much more sensitive in fact to low water clarity. Um, and so it's going to be harder uh, in some of these areas to establish widgeon grass, I think, uh, than eelgrass. Um, and so this means that site selection remains one of the most critically important um, uh, aspects of uh, a successful restoration. And, um, you know, I guess this under 
also sort of underscores the point that, you know, there are groups that really rely on physical transplanting rather than seed-based uh, restoration. Um, and and this, this, I think, is an example of um, where physical transplanting seems to have worked better than seed-based restoration. And uh, that is a strategy, while more time-intensive and expensive, could yield success in areas where seed broadcasting doesn't seem to be working. Um, so the take-home message is, I'm going to leave here. I know that this doesn't sound very hopeful, um, but some of the modeling work that our group has done uh, uh, with Brooke and other folks here on the call, uh, looking at the future, uh, suggests that for the Chesapeake Bay, uh, with continued nutrient reductions, uh, SAV is going to continue to uh, increase in coverage. Um, and so there does remain some possibility for a bright future for seagrass in our system. We know that these enhancements uh, have already had some benefits. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay and are benefiting SAV elsewhere. Uh, and we know that we have the tools to restore seagrass. And so the strategy has to be working together in combination, um, continuing to maintain and improve water clarity um, and, um, and, and applying these restoration methods and just making sure that we're not trying to restore in places where um, the, the system isn't ready uh, would be the best way for me to describe it. Uh, so a uh, big thank you to all the folks that have contributed to this, all of our co-authors, collaborators, uh, and funders. And uh, I'd be happy to take questions during the panel. Right, Brooke? We're not doing questions right now, right? Yeah, I think if we can hold off until the end, uh, unless anybody's got some burning, burning question that will, you know, shape the way they're thinking about things for the rest of this meeting, if you do, go for it. Take your, uh, take your mute off and pipe up but if not yeah i say we we move along to our next presenter thank you so much chris for that uh presentation very insightful as always uh we appreciate it so michael norman is up next michael is another one of my colleagues here in the chesapeake bay we've worked together also for years uh he has tons of experience on the technical aspects for sure of SAV restoration using mesohaline species. So Michael, if you would like to come off mute and share your screen, it's your go. All right, right, will do. Sharing screen. Are you there? We got it. You need to go in presentation mode still. For me. Okay, here we go. Yep, perfect. Well, hello everybody, um, thanks. Brooke for letting me uh, the opportunity to share today. Um, AACC and DNR have been working on SAV restoration together for about six or seven years and independently for decades, I, I would say. I work with uh, three really awesome people with DNR, Mike Naylor, Mark Lewandowski, and Stephanie Hall out and doing the field work. And uh, what I'm going to be doing today is I'll be reviewing the methods that we are using for the collection, the processing, and the distribution of SAV seed in the mesohaline region. And um, really couldn't, when when Brooke first asked me about uh, talking on this, she said that we we're gonna talk about beyond Zostra. And I, I had this picture of JJ and I, I still, I am in complete and total all of that number, that 9,000 acres that, um, and it it is an absolute true success story what's been done at VIMS and I'm in complete all of that and I'm just very I'm also very grateful for um, is what I consider to be absolutely essential data uh, that the aerial survey provides to everyone in the SAV program so I wanted to I guess give a shout out to VIMS for what I can still consider the draw jaw dropping number in terms of the numbers of acres and. And we're today what we're talking about going beyond Zostra and, and what our current research goals are is the restoration of the five dominant species of SAV in, in the oligohaline and mesohaline. Well, I threw the Vallisneria in there, but we've been working um, on an effort to distribute uh, Potomagetan, uh, Redhead, uh, excuse me, Redhead, Widgeon Grass, Sago, and Horn Pondweed. And um, that's been our current research goal for the past several years. Um, so what are our strategies for success? Um, one thing that we've gotten really good at, um, we have a very strong network of partners. Uh, I could list them all, but it would take a long time. But um, suffice it to say, we have river keepers, we have federal, we have state, we have local organizations that we have developed a very strong network of partners. 
and it's I think it's absolutely essential. Um, and we're actively working with others to help the staff. And right now, what we're doing is we're trying to in increase capacity by actively working with others to help them to establish their seed processing sites. And we've done that um, with one organization, the Shore River Keepers. We're in the process of doing it with another one, the Arundel River Federation folks on the South River here in Anne Arundel County. And we're looking for opportunities to help other people with, with establishing their seed processing sites. Um, in terms of the con continued improvement that we're looking to do, we're, we want to move into what we consider to be a phase two objective with, with our efforts. And that's going to, re that's regarding the seeding and the site research, site selection research that I feel is needed, um, with, with, uh, with our research. Um, well, today was also supposed to be out about challenges and seed distribution is really only a small fraction of what goes into restoration. Um, the distribution is the fun part. You go out, you put some seed overboard, and and um, but really, there's a tr just a tremendous amount of work in the pre and the post monitoring for any site that you establish. Um, there's a tr there's major time constraints that don't always allow for the attention needed to adequately run a program for the pre and post monitoring portion of it. And <laughs> friend of mine, um, Matt Pluto on Shore Rivers, he reminded me that it is a very big bay. And that the selection of sites is, is absolutely difficult, and it requires a certain, it requires targeting the river system, and getting to know the watershed. So, we are right now very interested in getting down to the watershed and the sub watershed level, looking for development of implementation implementation plans, working with our partners, and be, becoming more successful by really getting an opportunity to understand the watershed. And of course, all of that takes money. Multi-year funding is very important for us, but we're really looking at it in a very holistic approach of what those watersheds look like and the implementation plans that we can use for each individual system. Um, one of the big things I'm doing today is I'm going to sort of briefly review the eight steps that we use um, during our seed collection and processing steps. And... Um, of course, one of the one of the more important parts of it is to know when exactly to go out and get the seed. So there's a whole pre-harvest monitoring program that we have that relies heavily on volunteers. Uh, we also we but we also have a tremendous number. One of the one of the things that we find most difficult with our collections is because we work in partnership with a lot of other organizations. It's getting people to actually know when the seed is ready to develop. You know, I'm going to share a couple of sh images here of just the species that we work with. And really what you're looking at is that that picture on the lower left side. And this is redhead. Redhead is one of these plants that continues to put out inflorescence as it grows. And what we typically find in a volunteer setting is that people have little or no understanding of when is the proper time to collect. And because it is such a big environment and we're relying on people as volunteers to help us with this, we, we share this data pretty frequently in terms of the not getting them and the opportunity to know when is the right time to collect. Um, in particular, Redhead has four or five different inflorescence on it. You really don't want to collect that until the second or third week of July. It should have two, possibly three inf inflorescence that have seeds that are available. Oftentimes we get reports that don't really indicate whether or not there's seed available and we run into problems with that. Um, uh, Sago pond weed is the abs absolutely the same way. We harvest that typically in the second and between the second and fourth week of July. And again, the, the the ones on the to the lower left are those seeds that are fully ripe. We run into again op, um, obstacles with getting people to properly identify, and we do rely on river keepers and volunteers to give us some of that intel on that. Rupia is the same, and um, Vims is doing great work with Rupia. We have um uh rupia is a little bit easier to deal with um uh, so it's it, and we, we've been collecting that typically in the second two weeks of august uh chris is saying that he also goes um earlier in july and i think we we found that i guess further up the bay it's not quite that that way one of the things i would say about rupia and it's very important from a collection standpoint is pay attention to hurricanes uh, the number of years that we've been blown out by hurricanes when it comes to collection of rupia 
has been um, significant. It's there one day and gone the next. Uh, and then finally, Vallisneria, another one that we have issues with, the, the pods of Vallisneria um, are something that we collect in, in October, or later mid-October. Um, and again, this is this this is a completely different plant for us. It's a, it's a freshwater species, not not hanging out in the mesohaline, but we we have added it in. It's part of um, the program on the shore rivers for the eastern shore. Uh, once we get the intel and we and we've confirmed that the material is right, um, we typically go out at low tide. Um, we collect. It's best to collect at or near low tide, where the seeds are obviously a bit, um, visible. Um, we harvest by what we uh, what I call a grip and rip method. We'll take that material, that upper 12 to 16 inches of the material, the seed rich material, and we, we rip it off of the plant and put it in baskets and then drain it and then load it in. Typically, a harvest site is going to give us about 20 to 24 baskets. It's important that we don't over harvest in any one area. So we do try to limit what our harvesting is in any one particular area. Um, Sago is pretty similar as well. Um, this picture here, again, we're talking about potential um, over harvesting. Um, it's Sago is a little more selective in the way that we harvest it, but it's also um, this particular site is on the Severn River, and it is such a considerably large bed. Uh, you can see it. It's what you see behind uh, Mike and and Steph. There is. Um, is that amount of SAV is also out in front of them too. Our collection efforts, which yielded us about 24, 25 baskets, we never really had to move the boat when we got in here. We, we moved around in an area that was probably uh, about the size, maybe half of a football field. So um, the potential is there for great numbers. Um, <clears throat> once we get the material back in, what we like to do, um, this is this is where our divergence in terms of how we how we handle our seed. We don't have the resources that Vims does, and if we had those great big tanks that we could um, with flow through and with water, we may actually had, we may have adapted things differently. Uh, what we've found though is that when we get our boat full, we bring it back to the processing facility at the community college. Um, what we do from that point is we put it into these lower bins. We want to keep this material moistened and turned on a regular basis. And it's this after ripening step that seems to really work. We want seeds that are fully so full size when they come in. And the tendency is that they will actually after ripen on the material for a period of seven to 14 days, as long as it's kept moist. And it also allows them an opportunity to sort of, um, I guess, rot so that they lose the stems so that it's easier for processing. Um, what we have found, though, is that as long as at seven and 14 days is our standard processing time, it needs to get adjusted back and forth a little bit. But I guess the important thing here is that from the time that we pull this material from the from the water body of water, we are done and it is in containers after 14 days. So it's it's a it's a relatively fast process. Um, there's some really there's some points where we do a lot of work and other other days where we're just simply turning material. Um, but from a production standpoint, um, it's highly efficient. We use this method for Sago, for Redhead, um, and for Rupio. So how do we get this done? So once the material is ready, and this is this would be our first process would be after about a week. Um, the seed process is, processing is done with the device that we have um, dubbed the turbulator. Um, and it was it was it was designed and and built here at Anne Arundel Community College by an engineering student in our environmental program. And what the turbulator does is it forces air. Um, it's it's used to force air to dislodge seed from the rack, and it allows for that seed to settle below the turbulator for for retrieval. And um, we have been working with the turbulator for uh, over 20 years. Uh, it's, as you can see on the left, the, the turbulator itself was specifically designed for that tank. And I think I was noticing in Chris's pictures, he's got a couple of tanks that look just like that. And um, 
it's very adaptable to other tanks that, but the the principles are there um forced air and then the the allowing of the settling of the seed and the turbulator's got two basic components to it it's got an air jet assembly um and we i have some we just recently built one of these and we'll be building a couple more and hopefully a whole bunch more um if the NOAA funding comes through but essentially what we have is the inner the inner portion of it is our air jet assembly it's a it's a uh, adjustable PVC air jet assembly system. And what it does is it provides a uniform distrib distribution of jets of high, high pressure air. Um, the second portion of the system is the protective cage and the sieve assembly that goes around it. And um, it's made from the plastic mesh um, covered uh, marine aquaculture wire fencing. And um, we, we build the jet assembly, we, we fashion the, the protective cage around it and then uh, eventually the whole system is put in and out with um, just some vertical wooden handles and held into place in the tank um, above that to allow for um, the settling of the seed. Another important part of what we do is once the seed gets turbulated through the system, it still has to go through a refinement step. So we build a, a series of mesh sieves. We have half, one quarter, one eighth, and one sixteenth inch mesh sieves that we use. And they're stacked according to the type of material that we're working with. We stack them when we we um, we push we push the refined seed through to the bottom and capture it in in a double mesh screen at the bottom. Um, so this is what turbulation looks like. Um, this turbulation is usually uh, once the this is probably a seven day processing here. Um, material gets put in about three or four baskets worth of material gets put in. It gets it gets constantly agitated for somewhere between ten and fifteen minutes, and what it does is it allows you have to have enough movement and enough aeration in between the material to completely allow the seeds to to liberate themselves from the material. You can't put too much in, or it they, it tends to get stuck in the material. So we put in three or four baskets, and and we process that for about fifteen minutes. Um, once we're done with that, we get material out of the out of the turbulator itself. We push it through a seed refinement process, uh, and again, this is the stacked box sieve method. Um, a typical day, we're gonna we would probably process all of them. All twenty four baskets of that would get processed in a day, and our first processings would take um, a, uh, would also take a day. So at day seven, twenty four baskets would can be pushed completely through the turbulator, and then all the seed that was a part of that process would get refined down to what you see in the larger picture there that of that refined seed. Um, so it's 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 very labor intensive at the time, but it's it's um, it, what it does is it yields you this fantastic result of very very refined seed. Um, now Valsneria is something that is completely different for us in terms of when we collect it and how we process it. Uh, this is a uh, a project that we did on Turner Creek on the Sassafras, and Val is something that we we tend to use a whole lot more volunteers for. It's more volunteer intensive, um, it, and it's it, it is later in the season. Um, there's no need to get in the water with it. What we're collecting typically is just the pods from the surface. So, uh, at some point, we've got boats in at low tide, and everybody is hanging over, um, <laughs> hanging by their feet off of the boat to collect these pods. Um, once we get the once we get the pods in, we bring them in the college, we clean them, we edit them down to just pure pods and they get aerated. I guess similar to kind of what's happening with with um, Vim's eelgrass, it gets aerated for somewhere between six to eight weeks. And once the pods have been sufficiently decayed, we refine it and then we put it under a cold storage condition. And at the time that we refine it, we also do seed counts. We get an estimate on the seeds per gram and it gives us an opportunity to put the seeds into these containers at some known known amount. And, and that's been very helpful for us when it comes to distribution, uh, being able to know what's in each container and be able to target um, quantities on particular locations. So that's been very helpful for us. Before we go out, and I think Chris uses the drop method, we've used the drop method as well. And, um, that kind of drives me crazy, so I stopped doing it. Um, we store our seeds in either an aerated or a non-aerated condition. 
uh, un under a cold condition. We typically have been, we've been putting it out in the spring primarily, but we're starting to look at changes and moving over into the fall. Um, prior to uh, selecting distribution sites, we, we would get together and we would do seed germination testing on each seed lot, a replicate number of plates, look at the number of germination, uh, the amount of germination after seven and 14 days. And we kind of get a sense for whether or not the seed is good. Uh, this is rupia, it tends to germinate at a rate of about 85 to 95%, depending on the, on the haul. Uh, we found this to be almost easier than the, the drop method. It's a standard, standard protocol that we've been using for some time, putting the seed into a freshwater condition. And um, it really does help with, with coming up with the right values in terms of our distribution. Um, and then, so for us, distribution has, what we do is we, we select a site, we get the, um, we, we establish some mission planning for the site. Uh, when we go out to the site, we, we would, we would at that point, we would establish a polygons on the site based on depth. Um, and then we would navigate within that location and we would distribute a known amount of seed over that location. So that's how we've been doing it. Basically off the, so pre-selecting the site and then doing distribution by mixing uh, seed lots in with sand just to just as a sort of a spreader. Um, so we've been doing seed distribution with uh, sand, uh, sand seed mix for some time. A, a similar method that we're that we've been looking at possibly adapting for local waterways and getting some more volunteer involvement. We're considering um, in sort of an increased public awareness where we could use where we could provide seeds in this for in this form with a seed seed sand mix, and then perhaps get some volunteers to go out and 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 do some test sites for us. So some sort of smaller test sites. Again, working back kind of this holistic watershed approach that we're interested in, maybe get some maybe get some citizen interested and some public awareness going and be able to target some some areas, more areas on a river um, just by kayak. Um, now, what we did, what we've been doing in terms of our distribution is what we've been calling phase one. And, and we've been working with um, and, and again, thank God for VIMS aerial data. We've been working with the historical distribution uh, data that, that's, that's on VIMS, and then also looking at uh, anecdotally the shoreline types, trying to get um, areas that have sort of a natural shoreline. Um, again, we, we're, we use the, his, the uh, 1971 through present historical data, we, and then we move over to the recent distribution uh, we've determined, we've decided to go with the segments portion, the uh, use of the segments portion, and then we drill down. Uh, we look at the, we look at an individual segment and what, what has, um, what the historical coverage and, and recent distribution is. And, and from that point there is where we start to again, drill down again, and then look into that segment for areas or regions that we feel have the possibility based on current distribution and and that that's kind of our educated guess, if you will. We had a project that we worked on on the Magathy River, and in 2016 we went out to the Magathy and we, again using Vim's data, um, we we saw that there was a recent presence of SAV out there and good historical data, and um, we got approached by the Magathy River Association. They were very upset that there wasn't any SAV on the river. And and we're determined to get to get us out there and, and to to change that trend for them. And we went out and we put in about 3.5 acres of coverage. We put out um, of of seed of a mixed mixture of about 650,000 redhead and rupia seed in 2016. Um, aerial coverage was show, showed an increase after two years of seeding. There was good presence of um, redhead and rupia. And oddly enough, it's never really seems to stay where you want it to stay. So I think the, the just depend, the, it was the tidal activity in these areas, I think sort of moves seed around. That is one of the, one of the difficulties with, with, uh, seed restoration and a in tidal environments is they just tend not to stay where you want them to. It's interesting that the fall plantings in, in the lower bay, 
um, that the seed hasn't moved around significantly on those two. But we we uh, we we put out uh, so in 20, 2021, um, this area had had significant increases in SAV coverage, um, and it was it was all rupee and redhead. So the uh, the one little cove that was there was was all milfoil. We know that mil that that we weren't getting um, anything out of that cove. It was it was all rupee and redhead. So we never we're not really in any way making the claim that all of that SAV recovery in this area is 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 ours. But we do feel like we positively contributed to these areas, and we find ourselves in order to be successful working in regions where there is we are SAV bed adjacent. And um, in our mind, it's we we tried this approach where we were working on going out into areas where no SAV was present. So if or when it ever did establish, we would know that it was clearly us. And what we're finding is that SAV adjacent basically means that the conditions are right for SAV. So we we we, we want to see the increased acreage of SAV. We're trying to target these areas where um, where there's some known parameters where their success might be a little bit higher. Um, in the uh, Kerwin Creek area on the eastern shore, part of Eastern Bay, we went into there and in 2017. Um, it had some, it had a little bit of SAV present. We put in about an acre's worth of seed in uh, 2019, got some really good observations that fall. And then in, in um, 2019, um, Kerwin Creek had a, a tremendous increase in the amount of redhead that was present. So again, um, uh, SAV adjacent, conditions are right for SAV um, re restoration. Um, and so the overall goal is increased acreage of SAV. That's what we're trying to go for. Um, overall, over the course of about five year period, we went in and we did distribute, we distributed seed in about 57 different sites. Uh, we didn't monitor a number of them. About 26% of those sites never got monitored. Uh, about 50% of them after two years showed no growth. But we did see the presence of SAV after two years in about a dozen of our sites, or about 20% of the sites that we worked on. And just based on what we are considering to be conservative numbers in terms of coverage in those areas, we figured that 12 to 12 and a half acres of SAV coverage. Um, so well, our future efforts are, are what we're calling development of phase two. And what we don't understand about most of these sites, water quality is understood a lot more, but the sediment composition and other characteristics of the site are something that we're just really not, uh, that we do not have, have not studied enough. Um, we also have been sort of stuck on this spring distribution of seed. We want to look more at mixtures, depth, and timing of the plants. And and really make it um, uh, make it a sort of a full phased approach, um, and more importantly than that is once we want to do our site selection very well, and we want to convert some of our efforts into a multi year effort, where we can go back in and and continue to work on the same site. We feel like that's an important aspect. In order to be successful, I think you have to go at it. You have to you have to make the right choice, and then you have to you have to commit to it. And I think. It, that is going to yield results at some point for us. So that is it for me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. I have That's no idea how long that took, bro. <laughs> but um, I don't know. You're about 15, 20 minutes. Not too bad. Um, thank you very much. That's a ton of information. And uh, hopefully, so one thing I didn't ask the presenters, I don't think, um, let us know after this meeting if we can post these presentations online. That I think that would be very helpful for everybody to be able to see your data and your graphs over again. Um, but yeah, really interesting. And I think, you know, just a quick comment is that one of the things that made the NOAA uh, and the VIMS restoration so successful in the lower part of the bay is what you just mentioned, that repeat application year after year. So that's a really good point. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you so much. And we are gonna move on to Katya Inglehart, who, as she introduced herself earlier, is a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, but out in the mountains. So not, she's not on the bay, she's out in the mountains, but she still does a lot of work with SAV. So Katya, 
it all is right. all yours. Thank you so much. And I hope you can see these slides. We can, yes, and we can hear you. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, these two presentations before me are just, were just really amazing and I've learned a lot already today. So thank you so much to both of you. So um, I'm going to talk to you about Vallisneri americana. Um, I've worked with this species now since 2007. That's when we got our first grant. We is that I work very closely with Miley Neal here on the left. She's a professor at the University of Maryland College Park. She's a molecular ecologist, whereas I'm an um, experimental ecologist. So we, we kind of complement each other really well. So first of all, let's just talk about the goal of restoration really quickly. So um, the ultimate goal is to reestablish self-sustaining ecosystems that will be resilient to future perturbations without any ongoing human input. So what does that mean for SAV? Well, um, it means that we want uh, clonal expansion and, and seed production so that we have productive SAV beds that are self-sustaining. Self-sustaining in terms of you have more production of plants and they are being produced internally in the system itself. And then the other thing that was in that definition earlier was resilience, right? And so we also want a bed that is diverse enough, either in species richness or in genetic diversity to be resilient and to be able to adapt to new conditions because we do know that our environment is constantly changing. So why study Valsinaire Americana? Um, well, I um, we know that it is abundant in the Hudson River and the Chesapeake Bay, where I've where Miley and I have studied the species a lot. Um, it's also abundant actually across the entire eastern east coast. So um, we've also studied in the Kennebec River and we went all the way down to Florida. Although down there, up to about South Carolina, we might actually have a different species called Vallisneria neotropicalis. And um, so it's abundant in our rivers, in freshwater to oligohaline areas, and it's frequently used in restoration efforts of those sites. So let's first of all do our homework. What do we have out there? So this is the Chesapeake Bay, um, as well as the Potomac River. So here, up down here in Maryland, um, and what we have, uh, what we did, what we did was we sampled throughout the bay and the Potomac River um, to understand well what is the diversity out there. Valsinaria is a clonal plant. And so therefore it could very well be that the entire bay is just one super clone. And if that's the case, it doesn't matter where you get things from and where you put them into because it's the same individual no matter what. It can also be that the bay is very diverse and that there is genetic structure. And so we sampled in a bunch of different areas that you can actually see here in those dots. Um, so we have blue, red, yellow, and green dots. <clears throat> and within each one of those sites, we sampled 30 different individuals that were about 20 meters apart. So we, we try and be very consistent with our sampling so that we can compare different sites. And then what Miley has done is she can use a Bayesian framework um, using what's called structure analysis to figure out whether there is any genetic structure in her data, whether there are some SAV beds that are more closely related than others. And she actually, so first of all, what we found is, is that there is diversity out there. It's not just one super clone. Some sites are actually just one clone. Every single one of our 30 uh, plants is the same, uh, same individual, essentially. But then other sites, every single individual is different, a different genotype. So there's a wide variation of what we see in a bed. 
And then if you look at the structure analysis, we can see, so that's what you have here on the bottom, is we actually have four different um, genetic regions in the bay itself. So we have one in blue, which is the Susquehanna Flats area. Um, then we have one called the cent our Central Bay area. Um, so that's around Baltimore. It's actually a little bit more saline there. And then we actually have two, um, two regions within the Potomac River, one in the tidal Potomac and one in the non-tidal Potomac. We can also do the same thing in the Hudson River. So here on the left-hand side, we have our different sites that we sampled sa the same way that we did for the Chesapeake Bay. So we, we went all the way from the, 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 our southern end was Nyack. We couldn't find any, um, any Vasanaria any lower down there. It's, it's quite saline at that, well, not saline, it's brackish there. And then um, all the way up to above the, the fall line um, where it's non-tidal. So this is um, Mechanicsville here. And again, you can do the structure analysis. And what you can see is, is that there are three regions also in the Hudson River. And sure enough, the red region here is actually the, um, the areas, the SAV beds that are subjected to a little bit more salt than the other two regions, which are um, a lot more fresh. Then on the right-hand side, what you can also do um, with genetic analysis is what's called a barrier analysis. And so when you have these really dark red or um, fat red lines, that means that there is actually barriers that the analysis is, is um, detecting barriers and dispersal. And so here the, um, the beds are actually a little bit more isolated of each other. And then that can in turn um, affect a genetic drift and the populations becoming different from each other. So it seems like um, having salinity in the water for this fresh freshwater species is, is creating barriers and isolation and probably genetic drift. So this is sort of our homework here. We have, we have genetic diversity in two rivers. Um, this is the field sampling, as I already showed you here. Um, so so the, the yellow dots are about 20 meters apart. And then we also, what we do there is we, we actually collect plants, whole plants, because those whole plants will actually then, and I'll show you that next, be planted in my greenhouse so that I can propagate them but a little bit of leaf tissue goes with Miley and that's the genetic analysis is done on that little bit of leaf, leaf tissue. And then what she also collects and that's what's in the green dots, she collects just leaf tissue on some other plants but leaves everything else intact. And that's for an analysis to look at um, clonality in Ballison area. So through the years, as I said, I've been working on this since 2007. Um, I've collected a, a lot of plants and um, propagated them. And so I have this Valsinaria Americana repository, especially for the Hudson River and the Chesapeake Bay. So each plant that is collected um, goes into its own bucket. So they're not mixed at all. And then once Miley gives me the genetic data, I know which ones truly are genetically different. And so at this point, I have hundreds of these buckets in my greenhouse and um, dozens of different genotypes from each river system. And so what I can do with this repository uh, is do experiments. And I won't belabor that too much. Um, but I can, because this is a clonal species um, from one plant, I can get many plants that are identical to its mother plant. And so I can do all kinds of replicated experiments with them. And so over the years, I've found, for example, that every genotype um, or th that these genotypes vary in their phenotype. So some of them are so so what you see in black here are 
basically the names of different genotypes. So every one of these labels is a different genotype. And then what you see around here are, um, are, are basically different phenotypes. So for example, we have some that have short leaves. On the other side of the graph, we have long leaves. Okay, so that's one axis. We can also look at narrow leaves versus wide leaves, um, whether they produce many ramets or few ramets, high to reproduction or not. In the middle here, you have number of flowers because this graph is, is kind of three-dimensional as well. So we know that now that, you know, the, the plants might look similar to us when we see them out in the bed and how, how could they be all that different? It turns out that they look just as different as you and me look different. Then we can also, what I can also do is I can mix the genotypes into different population, experimental populations that differ in, in genotype diversity. So on the x-axis, we have um, two genotypes um, in a bucket versus four genotypes versus eight. And then I can look at all kinds of um, responses to that. So one, for example, that was really interesting is the number of flowering events that I observed through the season. And what I found that even though I planted the same number of individuals per bucket when we got started, genetic diversity really mattered in the number of flowering events within each bucket. <laughs> and that's really important because you want them to sexually reproduce. So I can go on and on with these experiments, but I also want to talk a little bit about restoration. So besides experiment, we can field plant as well. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the propagation that I do with Balsanaria and, and basically my experiences with that. So in the greenhouse, we have these buckets and each one of these buckets has a different genotype in it. And when I'm interested in going out, let's say, and restoring an area, um, let's say in the Potomac, what I would do is I would pick um, genotypes out of my repository that is within the genetic region that, um, that I would like to restore, okay? And then I take a bucket and I, I grab all the plants out of the out of them. And so then I get, you know, these strings of plants. And what I then do is I plant them into new buckets, about five plants per bucket or so, maybe a few more if it's just a real small plant. Um, what I use as substrate is just actually the cheapest substrate I can find at Lowe's or somewhere. Um, I don't want too much organic matter, but I definitely don't want there to be any amendments. And then what a lot of people do, although I actually don't do it so much, um, but what's also good is so, so you fill up your bucket with about 10 centimeters of substrate. Then you, um, you wet it a little bit so that you have a little bit of standing water um, over top of the substrate. Then you plant your plants and then you cap it with some, with some um, sand and then you can fill the rest of the bucket with water. So that's how I create new colonies from um, colonies that I take out of the repository. And then just from in one season, I, um, I'm able to actually um, get quite a few plants out of that. And over just a few seasons, I can, I can really ramp up the production. So this is my greenhouse setup. So um, if I really want to propagate and ramp up production, I actually put um, my propagation containers into a water bath. And that allows the plants to expand a little bit more, grow longer leaves. And that actually um, seems to be correlated with how big of the of turions that they produce. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about turions later as well as how productive they are in flowering. And then, so this is on the left-hand side, you can see some of the water baths. 
And then if you turn around in the greenhouse, this is sort of the, um, the view you get. And then there's a whole other side of the greenhouse as well, which is also filled with these buckets. And then um, actually this is what's happening right now at the end of the season, starting in October and especially November, the, um, the green leaf tissue senesces. And then that's when you know that the plants have um, put all of their energy that they used to have in leaves and some roots into these underground storage organs called turions. And so what we can do, we, we just have a sieve and we, um, we take out some sediments out of these buckets. Usually they're about four handfuls worth. And then we just sieve them through some water. And then what you immediately get are these turions, which are very easily picked out. Um, so in all, actually, each one of these containers, which in the beginning of the summer were planted by with about five plants, yield on average about 65 turions. So um, you can ramp up production really quickly. Now, the other thing that's really fun, and, and um, you've heard a little bit more about that, is the flowering. Um, so, you, so Michael and Chris have talked about, you know, the sexual reproduction and the seed uh, seeds part of of um, of different species, and of course, Valsinaria also flowers. So, on the left hand side, we have female flowers. They're just getting started, um, and so you know that within the next two or three days, it's going to be an open flower at the water surface. Um, then you have about three days if you want to pollinate this flower. On the right-hand side here, you actually see some male flowers that are floating on the surface. They are actually made um, at the bottom of the plant and then um, are released by the plant and float freely on the water surface. And that's how they come in contact with, with the female flowers that have to stay put. We then pollinate these um, these flowers. So we often what we what I like to do is have female and male genotypes. I should have said Valsinaria is dioecious, so you have male and female plants. And so what you can do in water baths is is I usually have two females to a male, um, and and that way if a male um, flowers, then there's already male pollen in, in the water to pollinate the female flower. If I'm lucky and they're all flowering at the same time, which they often do probably because there's some, some hormonal thing going on in the water. But if that's not the case, and if they don't flower at the same time, I just take male um, flowers from one water bath and just bring it in this cup over to some flowers. And then at the end, once I know that they've been pollinated, I actually put a string around them so that I know that, you know, I've I've tried my best here to be the matchmaker. And so then this is what um, a container looks like at the end. Um, so we have two female containers up here at the top left and at the top, uh, no, top left and here at the bottom. And the reason why I know that is that, you know, these strings here, and then you see, um, yeah, so you have all these strings here that that you, where you can tell that they've been pollinated. And then I just label them here on the rim. So the first, um, the first number is the genotype of the female, and the second number is the uh, genotype of the male, and then I just put down the date. And so you can actually see here that I um, five females were pollinated in one day, which is this little nubbin right here. So anyway, it's just a lot of fun doing this. And so then seed pods are produced, and you've already seen that um, with Michael when he when he harvests them out in the field. We can do the same thing in the greenhouse. So within each one of my water baths, I can get this many seed pods. So it's it's actually highly productive even doing it in the greenhouse. But what's really nice is, is that I know the mom and dad 
for each one of these seed pods. So it's it's a lot more controlled with I I know where these where this material comes from. And so then I feel more confident about, yeah, I can put it into this area because it's within the same genetic region. Then I can also use plants or turions to use, to put into these burlap bags that I'm developing right now. I'm developing this technique right now. So the idea here is, is that um, you have a burlap bag, or this is actually cheesecloth here. You fill it up with your substrate, and then you plant, I plant around five, not just around, I put five in each bag, uh, five turions or plants, and then they're put in a water bath, and through time they germinate, the plants then poke through the holes. So this is, this is on the left here, this is sort of the beginning stage. And on the right hand side, we have what you see about six weeks later. It happens really quickly. And you can even see how there's some um, ramets forming outside. So they're really clonally expanding out of this, out of this uh, burlap bag. And um, and so it's it's a really, I find it a really nice system that is compact and that is pretty trans transportable. The reason why there is a, a pink ribbon is because it's a girl. So I also know the girls and boys, you would want to have girls and boys going out into the field. And then this is what it looks like for transport. So these can be packaged pretty easily for transport. Um, what I want is the uh, the least amount of stress to these plants um, so that they can go out into the field and immediately get going. And then this is sort of the field deployment. Um, obviously it's not in the field, it's in the greenhouse just to show you. So I have a burlap bag and then I have a stake. It's actually kind of a snow stake. It's very flexible so that in the field, if something rolls over it, it can just bend and then go get upright again. So the burlap bag is staked um, into the ground. And um, so we can, what you can actually just do is, is put, put, the bur put the stake into the burlap bag while you're basically still in your boat. And then um, you can just drop it down with the stake already being in the sediment. And then what you can do is put an exclosure around that as well. And that's all I have for you right now. I should also say that um, I, I worked with this burlap bag technique just this last summer for the first time in um, Oxen Cove in the Potomac River. And um, I was not successful, but I don't think it's necessarily uh, because the burlap bags don't work out. It probably was a sight thing. Um, so I still needed to think about this some more and tweak it. Awesome. Thank <laughs> Thanks, Katya. That was really cool. I um, I don't think I've ever seen like pictures of your greenhouse set up. So that was, <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> it's my <laughs> playground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So I think um, since we we went over time, which is totally fine, uh, those were all amazing presentations. And I think I speak for everyone on this meeting that lots of good applicable information as we all move forward with SAV restoration. So I think what we're going to do since we're over time is skip the breakout sessions. Uh, you know, we were um, not convinced that we were going to do those anyway. So officially going to skip them and take about a half an hour, maybe 35 minutes for an open question period. We'll take a little break after that, and then we'll go into Becky's uh, presentation about the regulatory aspect of all this restoration talk. So I have a bunch of questions, but I'm gonna, I wanna open the floor to our members to, to go ahead and ask any questions they might have. So feel free to just yell out, raise your hand. If you are more comfortable putting your questions in the chat, feel free to do that and I'll read them out and they can apply to any of the panel presenters today. So. Do we have any questions? I know we do. 
I actually had a question for Katya about okay. the uh, Valisneria seed, and, and I'm wondering, have you done anything with S with uh, seed restoration with your Valisneria seed in um, kind of a larger, what would be considered a larger restoration effort? No, I have not. And so I'm just so excited to be able to listen to you because I think you can um, hopefully at least get me started on that. Um, so yeah, no, I have not done that yet. I have the seed pods and I know how to make them. Well, we know how to refine them and get them out there too. And I think Valisneria is going to be a really good choice. We've um, We actually had a SCC student who did some Valisneria work in sort of a, a tidal fresh area that had some aggregate bottoms to it and got really good success. And um, I'd be love, love to get the Valisneria restoration going full steam ahead. And the other comment about your remark, and this dates me a little bit, but back in 1986, we used to, we bought wet, we bought, um, wetland stuff from a company called wildlife nurseries out of oshkosh wisconsin yes and they had cheese bat cheesecloth bags just like that <laughs> for putting <laughs> turians in and um it's nice to see that 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 um they've that you're still using that method i so i was i was impressed with that yeah actually that's how i got the original idea with um using first cheesecloth. And then I thought, well, how about I try burlap bags? Um, it turns out that, you know, so what I like about both of those systems is, is that they degrade. And so then after a while you have nothing in the system, right? right? No plastic, nothing. Um, but on the other hand, they degrade. And so, um, so if you leave them long enough in the greenhouse, all of a sudden you have bleh nothing um so so i'm still trying to re refine that and figuring out how how to actually keep them around longer i think they actually degrade too fast interesting anybody else have any other questions becky's got her hand raised go ahead becky Hi. Yeah, thanks. So this is a question, I guess, for, for the group, um, mainly Chris, Michael, and Kachi, I suppose. But in terms of your water sources, so, you know, you're using a lot of water to process the materials, and then you're also using the water to either store the seeds or to, you know, the raise the plants in. What sources of water are you using? And are you doing anything in terms of like adding nutrients or salt to, you know, hit a certain target um, for your chemicals? Um, I, I can start for for Vims. Uh, so we have a couple of different things that we do. Um, I mean, we have flow through seawater systems that are, we're, we're drawing water from the York River. Um, and I mean, there is a filtration system that it passes through, but it's pretty rough. I mean, there's a lot of things that come through and, um, and that's fine for dealing with seeds from our river. Um, but it's not, great for dealing with seeds coming from other places and so i mean one of the things that we've done is for our eelgrass work on the eastern shore uh stuff that gets collected down there stays down there um, our partner at the nature conservancy they've got a facility now um where they're using the local seawater um and when we bring stuff up here um from elsewhere i mean we will use closed recirculating uh tables and we will mix up our own water so we use a lot of instant ocean um, and, uh, we don't add any nutrients or anything to it. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's going to come from the sediment if we're growing things out. And then one of the big things that we found is, you know, temperature control is super important with our closed recirculating system. So having, uh, nice, adequate chillers and then really good, uh, filtration systems. So, um, we use a, a multi-step, uh, small bead, uh, fil filtration system. We replaced our sand filters um and a um a uv tower and if the uv tower goes out um which has happened before i mean the whole tank is pretty scummy and uh that really drives up seed mortality quickly uh so it, it is important uh to have clean um temperature 
controlled water. Um, and uh, in situations where that's failed on us or working with partners that didn't have as good of a system, I mean, their, uh, their seed viabilities are just much lower. I mean, we'll have like 90% uh, seed survivorship during the holding period here. And then our partners, you know, down on the shore with less sophisticated systems, they might have 40 or 50% survivorship. So that's just, that's real, makes you want to cry when you lose millions of seeds uh, due to kind of poor storage. So it's, it's worth the investment. Now, for us, we're a little bit different. We don't have that flow through system. It's probably why we adapted the way we do things. Our material is brought into those bins and then we just keep it moist with just really just tap water. Um, if we're just moistening it enough, there's enough salt on the material itself to um, to not be a problem with. And we just, we moisten and continue to, to turn that material over a period of four, 14 days or so. Um, in terms of the actual processing, the turbulator itself, uh, we're just using a municipal water source because it's such a short act. Um, we we probably, I, I was trying to put a number on it. Um, we use thousands of gallons, but not tens of thousands of gallons. You know, the tank gets filled, it's three, 400 gallons. Um, we do that five or six times perhaps. And then we also have the water that's needed for the, the for the refinement of the seed. In terms of our cold storage, we we make our own water. We typically store rupia at a 30 part per thousand. We use instant ocean or Hawaii salts. Uh, we store our, our brackish at, at 10 parts. We Sago and Redhead get stored at about 10 parts per thousand. And then the Valisneri at fresh. Uh, in terms of the viability and storage, we found that the more you refine the seed, it helps you do two things. It helps you get really good estimates on the number of actual seeds that you have. So that's why those box sieves are important for us for the refinement step. And we also find that the lack of organic content in the material as it's being stored really does aid with um, uh, viability. And, and, and we get a lot less um, microbial action and it's a cleaner seed and it's a higher, germ, a higher germination rate on the tail end of it. Uh, but for us, it's the water sources. Uh, like I said, we're not we're not using a lot, uh, tens of thousands maybe. But um, that's it. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, and then for me, um, since I only work with Valsenaria, I I just use fresh water. Um, up in the mountains, I don't have I don't have that source, the Chesapeake Bay water source or anything like that. Um, but I, I used to use dechlorinated water and then decided to just, just, just try tap water. So chlorine in it, and it made absolutely no difference. So I just chose, I just continued on to do tap water and that has some nutrients in it. And I don't want any more nutrients in it because as Chris said, the nutrients come from the sediment, um, if I do think that the that that nutrients are getting depleted and you can kind of see it in the in the tissue of the plants, they just kind of get a little bit bleached, yellow, kind of brittle. Um, I use I actually have it here in my office. I use these these nutrient capsules that I can just stick in into the substrate and um, it just gives it extra nutrients but for the most part i feel that the the tap water and just what's in the sediment gives the plants enough nutrients yeah. Yeah. so I, i've got a question for mike actually that that's this kind of brought up um so you know we've we've found that um in the past that if we take seeds from higher salinity and put them into too low of a salinity in tanks like too big of a difference that puts a lot of osmotic stress on the seeds and they can pop. Um, so we try to match perfectly, uh, you know, between where we get it from and what we're storing it in. It sounds like that's not the approach that, that you have necessarily. Have you ever run into issues with the like osmotic differences going from, like if you collect it at 15 and then you're storing it in 10, does, does that ever cause problems for you with any of the taxa? Actually, that's a good question. And, and we did find that if you store, when you select, for for example, for rupia, we put rupia in at least 30 parts per thousand. 
um, because anything less than that, and you get this, you get this um, germination effect. Um, the ten is what we targeted when we talk when we talk about Sago and 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 Redhead, and, and I think that's usually about the range that we're collecting them in. We're somewhere, maybe not ten. It might be sort of that nine to twelve range, but it's usually it's usually within a margin of error. Uh, but we do know for a fact that. Um, storinated at or near a similar salinity is very important in terms of storage. Um, you take a you take a rupee and put it in zero, and I don't care how cold you keep it, it's going to germinate at some point because of those osmotic differences. Mm. Um, we get a good simulation of germination by taking it out of a 30, for example, for rupee, we'll take it out of a 30 and put it into a lower condition under a conductive or, or an inductive treatment, light and temperature, and we get good germination results with that. If you took a rupia seed, even if it's been stored for six months under cold conditions, and we've seen this, um, you take it out of a con cold condition and put it into an inductive condition at 30 parts, you get very little germination out of it, even if even though it's had the cold treatment. So we have found that, that reductions in salinity are important for germination. Um, and we do try to target about or near where we collected it from. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Anything that's popped up? I don't see any hands. Well, so one Chris, of the... Chris, I had a question for you about the scale of your collection right now. And you had a lot of bags and, and I was just curious about what your annual collection numbers are. Um, in total across all species or for rupia? Just for the rupia. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think that it's varied from year to year, um, depending on as we've kind of refined, um, our, um, our, our collection target in terms of dates. It's interesting that you guys are doing August. Like we, we just found that most of it's stripped bare of seeds by, by wow. late August and early August we'll get seed, but just not as much as we do in like mid to late July. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, you know, I think in terms of numbers, um, you know, you know, one to two million uh, wigeon grass seeds is is kind of the the ballpark that that we're getting, um, and we can do that in a relatively short period of time. I mean, we're talking two to three outings, four or five people, um, each one, you know, may, maybe four hours collecting. Um, so it doesn't take that much effort. Um, but the key we found is you got to be in the right spot. So we actually yes. we spend a bit more time just cruising around and looking at the different meadows to find which are the ones that are really flowering and are, are heavy with reproductive shoots and heavy with seed. And if you can get in the right spot, man, you can fill a lot of bags really fast. But if you're in the wrong spot, you can spend hours and not get a whole lot out of it. Well, that was listed as one of my challenges and one of the things that we're having a problem with. And... Um... It's about knowing when it's ready and where it is. And we've, we we got sent out recently uh, this past season to what was supposed to be these big, enormous beds, what turned out to be a whole bunch of Sago. <laughs> it wasn't even Rupia. <laughs> and we don't have, we, we are really running into problems with being able to get real and good data. We just don't, we can't get out there. And it's the bay and its rivers are a big place. So knowing where to be at the right time. But that's similar to what we get. We could go out in one time, and if, like what you're saying, you get onto a good bed, we can get somewhere between one to two million in one outing. And the mm -hmm. reason I ask is that if we're going to ramp up production in terms of SAV restoration, it's important for everyone here to recognize that if we spread out this effort over the over the lower bay for Rupia, for example, and you get a couple of organizations in a couple of dis, dis, distant locations, Mm -hmm. We can get into those tens and twenty million seeds rather quickly, and then without with little or no impact. Because again, the same thing is true of rupia as it is with sago. We get we got so much sago seed this year, and we were always within earshot of the radio on the boat. I mean, it's and it's so for us um, knowing to be there at the right time is important. But going forward. We can ramp this up without hurting the bay. It's really now phase two. Where are you supposed to be in terms of the restoration itself? Mm -hmm. And that's where all of our work has got to be. Mesohaline's a little bit harder than where you are. I hate to admit it, but it is. Yeah. 
I mean, it's, it, I'll just say that it's, you know, same, same what you just said. Um, you know, we got 10 million uh, as Oscar seeds this, this past season. And that was not a, it was, it was, it was work, but it wasn't a huge effort. Um, and, mm-hmm. and we don't have to yes. go very far from the boat um, to get it. it really makes you think how much of these seeds that these beds are producing are just getting consumed or, or rotting. You know what I mean? Like, cause they, clearly they're not all producing plants. Um, most of them are not. So I think, I think there's seed despair. I don't, I didn't know how far we would get into, I guess we would call it bioturbation. Um, it turns out minnows really love SAV seed. Uh, I have a tank, a large tank here at the college that I have filled with sheep's head minnow and mummy chug. I could throw four pounds of SAV seed in there and it will be gone the next day. Amazing. These fish That's eat cool. this, they eat all of it down to nothing. The ones that get away and turn into seedlings and germinate in between little oysters and cracks, they wait for them to sprout and then they pull them out and eat them too. <laughs> um, I swear to God, I got 20 fish in this tank and they can't get enough of the stuff. Yeah. I now think that the reason SAV is not in one meter and less water is because all the minnows are eating them. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why we always do, and I think mean, most, most people here that are doing this, don't put the seeds out right away. We wait until right before germination because we know that 99% of what we put out, if we put it out in July, is going to get consumed by the time uh, germination is supposed to occur. So we try to time it to right before the seedlings would start naturally germinating. Um, and that really, you get a lot more bang for your buck. Um, I, I see Katie has her uh, hand up. <laughs> I was just about to interrupt you. <laughs> Go for it, Katie. Yeah, Chris, you touched on the topic of climate change, warming waters, um, and this might overlap some of the regulatory discussion that's coming next. But and this question could be for any of you, I guess. But has your region uh, considered bringing in seed stock or plants from areas even further south to try some of these restoration experiments given given the warming waters or is that just more of a regulatory barrier I'm that... so glad you asked that question and I'm equally glad that Erin Shields is here uh, I'm going to let her answer that <laughs> yeah we uh, great question we brought up seeds eelgrass seeds from North Carolina into the Chesapeake Bay and and planted them in experimental plots. Um, We do a copper sulfate treatment beforehand that's supposed to, you know, minimize, uh, you know, anything you might be introducing. But in short, no, there's no regulatory barriers that exist, at least between our two states right now. I know it's a, a hot topic of future discussion, so there may become <laughs> there may become some uh, uh, ground rules that are established. But um, this project, we had state um, regulatory agencies from both states on our advisory committee, and they were both fine with it. So um, I know that's not the case, uh, you know, moving up the East Coast. But for now, here uh, people have not had any issues with it. Yeah. So you yeah. transported both seeds, you said seeds and plants themselves? No, just, just seeds. Just seeds. Okay. So we've All right. actually, we've done plants, not put in the field, but we've grown them up in the greenhouse, both Rupia, Zostra, and also Halliduli from North Carolina. And yeah, BMRC, same same deal with us. They, they, they said that they do not, nor will they ever consider any seagrass and invasive or noxious species, um, which was very supportive. Um, Actually, North Carolina was more uh, resistant to the idea of taking whole plants. They're very concerned with us digging up plants, uh, even small amounts of plants. I mean, we're talking about, you know, a couple hundred um, seedlings, uh, maybe like a meter or two square area getting uh, denuded. Um, so there were there were a lot of more concerns about digging up the plants and, and moving them. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Yeah, I think North Carolina um is getting a little uneasy that the Chesapeake Bay folks keep wanting to take their plants so (laughs) that might be the 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 bigger issue down there but in the Chesapeake Bay I think we are in um a a pretty desperate situation with eelgrass and folks are generally open uh to to this idea enthusiastically (laughs) thanks Aaron thanks everybody so one of the um 
one of the things that I wanted to point out is that, so as we talk about SAB restoration, one of the things that keeps coming up is the possibility of over harvesting seeds. And so, you know, and need, the need to like make sure that we're doing it responsibly and, um, you know, with well chosen harvest sites and things like that. So I'm really encouraged to hear you all talk about the fact that it seems like there's there are plenty of seeds out there if we, you know, just do the harvesting responsibly. So I, that's very encouraging. Um, another one, another question that I had is about, so Chris, you and Michael both mentioned concern over, I guess, seed transport after you put the seed in the water and they don't always stay where you intend them to stay and how you can control for that. I feel like I've heard you, Chris, and maybe you, Michael, too, talk about doing a more precise um, planting where you're maybe putting a little bit of sediment over top of the plants. Is that, have you done that to try to keep them in place? Have you, you know, or is it just entirely too time consuming and difficult to actually like get in the water, you know, plant them like a garden <laughs> or, so, you know, what so do you have to say about that? For our, for our part, uh, for both wigeon grass and eelgrass, um, we found that if we just sprinkle them in place, they stay. Um, now that's not going to be true of all species, but we just don't find that unless it's unless it's an area that's unsuitable for planting because it's uh, too much velocity and water movement, um, that we won't see seeds moving more than a meter or two, uh, maybe as much as five meters tops. So they really do stay put quite nicely. They're 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 negatively buoyant. Um, uh, as for that planting, uh, we've never done, at least I've never done that. Maybe JJ tried it yeah. years back. Um, but I have seen some recent um, seed injection robots that are being <laughs> developed. I've, I talked with some of the, the folks, like the engineers that are building these things last week. Um, and in some areas, there's a paper that came out, uh, I think this past year, 2023, um, that you know, they, they saw like a order of magnitude increase in seedling establishment with the seed injection process. Um, and this was, a, this was an area where if they scattered the seeds, I guess they weren't staying um, or maybe they were all getting consumed, but by injecting them a few centimeters into the sediment, they had much higher success. They were getting up to 10 to 20% seedling establishment. That's what we get uh, when we just broadcast normally. So that's mm -hmm. not something that I think we need to do here. But in some areas, it definitely seems like that's the way to go. Yeah, interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah, Brooke, that's actually a good question. I was going to ask that question. And I thought if there's somebody here from the Corps, they'd tell me I need a permit, um, <laughs> which you probably do. But up here in the mesohaline, it just seems like we have these slick, featureless bottoms. And we don't have these wide open expanses of very stable water depths. And I feel like seeds really do get pulled around a lot more up here. I thought perhaps there'd be, if I were to do something, it would be kind of throw the seed off the front of the boat, drag some kind of rake across the back of the boat so that the seed falls out and has time or, or broadcast the seed and then come back with some sort of fingered rake or something, just something to disturb that featureless bottom to maybe to get it to hold a little bit more. It'd be something that would I be interested in doing on a small scale, but yeah. I just I just feel like I don't know the answer to whether or not we would because we're disturbing the bottom whether we would need to talk to the core or whether our friends at DNR could give us a pass because it's <laughs> experimental or. <laughs> hmm. I would say yeah, I mean, so the eelgrass restoration I did we were putting out berms of oysters to to kind of create that that hydrodynamic break. Um, and that was a special kind of arrangement that we had because it was a research lease that we were doing that on. But it was that same concept in that we wanted those areas that had high flow because it was keeping the water column clear, but then not so high flow that you put out seeds and they went away. And I mean, it, this is going to be the third year post seed deployment. And we had great growth those first two years. So of course, I'm eager to get out there and see how it's doing this year. But that was one of our methods to get at that that issue mm -hmm. of of having some type of structure um, to help keep the the seeds in place and not flowing through. Because I, I, your other point, Mike, when you're saying choosing a site for doing the restoration, right? We can do all the harvesting we want, but unless yeah. we're putting the seeds out of place, 
mm -hmm. they're actually going to grow. And one of the restrictions that I'm up against is not having the maps that you guys do. So the fact that you're <laughs> saying, we're not really even sure where the best seed beds are is like, ah, but if you don't have it, how am I ever going to get there? And so the proxy that we use is just like you mentioned, where are existing beds that either their densities have declined or, you know, that there might be adjacent areas of similar depths that I can add some more seed to, but that gets into the you know, the permitting and the regulatory side too. And that is that really considering making more seagrass beds if the natural expansion and contraction um, might include those areas where I'm adding seed. So a lot of, and then that's what ended up picking for this eelgrass restoration project that I mentioned. It was a site that there was no eelgrass that was recorded there because the flow, I knew enough and had done enough of the background um, abiotics to know that one of the reasons was the flow in the area washing the seeds away. So I was able to <clears throat> alter it, but that was much smaller scale. So, so one of the things that we've, we've found that can be helpful with that retention in the lower bay is uh, um, the abundance of diopatra uh, polychaetes. So the, uh, the, the little, little um, garden, gardening uh, polychaetes. Um, you know, the, the more holes that you have in the sediment in general, um, just it just helps kind of collect them and they sort of aggregate around those um, those things. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention was I, I thought it was a little um, well interesting and maybe time consuming, but I, I had heard about a method where folks up in New York were gluing uh, zoster seeds to the backs of clams, uh, little, little, <laughs> little seed clams. And, um, you know, I, in a high flow area, that could be really effective if the clams you know, don't get washed out and they burrow down into the sediment. Um, so so another thought. That's awesome. Are there any other questions from, from the members? Looks like Emily in the chat said that they're doing that at Con College. You got a gluing, a gluing crew, maybe a glue crew. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be willing to tell us about that? I'm fascinated. Hi, yeah, sorry. I couldn't okay. get my mic to work. Um, no I'm technically not officially on the project. I've just helped out a bunch because I'm technically with UConn. But um, one of the professors that I was kind of friends with is doing a project at Conn College, Maria Rosa. She is somebody who would be a really great resource for you guys to reach out to as well. Um, she is actually using that process. Basically, we just had this... Um, reef safe glue that this guy developed and we sat there rolling the clams in seeds and we put them in this big basket and dropped them in and they were actually put in certain locations I wasn't on that part so I don't know exactly where they put the clams afterwards but we it was literally like you said we had a team of people with a little bit of water sprays that we were spritzing all over the clams and literally rolling it in the glue <laughs> that's cool <laughs> it, it's pretty cool it's a good project <laughs> Yeah, that's the kind of innovative, weird, like kind of out of the box, you know, stuff that I love hearing about. So thank you. And well, sounds I don't like... know if anyone in the group has any knowledge of pelletizing seeds, but more and more seeds are being pelletized <laughs> these days. And so for us, when we're trying to do a large scale project, um, we're talking about a lot of seed where we want to be able to get it for example, pelletize. If you get enough seed pelletized, it's flowable. You can throw it. You can do stuff with it. You can manipulate it. And with the idea being that that pellet, if you get it the right size with the right material in it, it falls to the bottom. It disintegrates. And maybe there's something in there. Maybe there's a sticker or something like that that actually holds it better to the bottom or at least gives the seed an opportunity to sort of stay in place because of the amount of material in the pellet itself. But I don't know those technologies, but for me, large scale or even those several acres of stuff, we need to be able to get it out there and get it done quickly and efficiently pelletizing because I get, pellet, I get pelleted seeds all the time now. All the small seeds that you buy from these catalogs, so many of them are pelleted now. Yeah. Um, it's just so much, you know, they're pelletizing carrots, for God's sakes. Um, and... <laughs> I would be curious to know if anyone had any knowledge of seed pelletization. <laughs> well, oh, no. I know Bob Murphy with Touch Attack worked on seed pelletization probably a decade or so ago. And I'm not sure where it went or what happened with it, but he's talked about it before. 
And I've heard that Johns Hopkins um, environmental folks are doing that with SAV seeds too. But again, I haven't gotten any details. It was a very new project about probably six months ago. So I, I'll make a note to, to reach back out and see where it's going. But, but yeah, they, I know the Bob's worked on it. So maybe we can uh, get an update from him at some point. I can, I can bring this to him. Let him know that we're talking about this yeah. and group might want some more information. Cool. Thanks Paige. Yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting. Um, so with, with a burlap bags, that's to some extent, um, it, it's in a similar vein, just in a, in a bigger package. So I was thinking one, one thing to do with my Valsinaria seeds is to mix it up in my substrate, put it into the bag, and then it's, it's all confined in that bag. And then that, that is dropped down. And so the same thing with turions you would just have with the seeds. What I found, what I find with Valisinaria though, is that, so you can drop the seeds and let's say that they stay put, but then they germinate and the germination process pops the plant right out of the sediment. And it's because the, the seeds germinate and they produce these roots, these tiny little roots. And those roots are kind of just pushing the plant out of the sediment often. And with just a little bit of current, it can wash that plant away, that seedling away. So um, there's the, there is a second challenge there too. It's not just deploying the seeds, it's keeping the seedlings in place too. So I was actually wondering, um, I want to do some work on maybe using coconut mats or something to keep things in place. So I don't know whether anybody has experience there. Nobody's piping up to say so. Yeah. So I actually have another question for you, Katya, and then we'll take a quick uh, bio break before we get into Becky's presentation. But I was wondering with, uh, you know, so we put in this big old um, proposal for NOAA funding to expand our SAV uh, restoration capacity through, you know, building of nurseries, you know, building of uh, seed processing facilities, education, training, all the whole nine yards. And one of the things that kind of came up that we didn't wind up putting in the proposal, but it was the idea to use, uh, you know, agricultural techniques to increase flowering in a nursery setting. And I was wondering, you, so you've got your buckets full of Valisneria and they're obviously flowering. So are you doing anything to like to get them to flower? Or are they just happily flowering on their own in that controlled environment? Because a lot of people have, you know, in my discussions in the SAV restoration world, they, they say that it's hard to get plants to actually flower in in those controlled environments. So what are you finding with your your wild celery plants? Yeah, so I want to do a whole lot more research on that as well. Um, first of all, some genotypes flower really well. They're very prolific. And then others I can't, I can't get to flower. So no. there's definitely that genetic component there. Um, so you just you have to have the right amount of plants. But I've also found um by just I, I, I collect measurements on the length of leaves and then also the time of flowering that um, that plants, Valisneria plants will only flower uh, when they reach a certain height. And so if my buckets are too small, then they'll not reach that length of leaf to even want to flower. And so that's why it's important to put them into a water bath where they can actually stretch out a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, that that was definitely important. Um, okay. And then I'm also thinking that if you put male and female flowers or male and female plants together in a water bath, so that's, I think a water bath is really important. If you have the two sexes together, then there's some sort of hormonal communication going on saying, hey, how about we flower? <laughs> <laughs> love is in the air. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> love is in the air. And um, so I think maybe some of that is going on as well making sure that that both sexes are there and communicating in the water. Okay. 
Well, that's good to know. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, are there other questions that we want to pose? We've lost Chris. Chris had to leave uh, for another obligation, but we've still got Michael and Katya uh, to answer any further questions that you might have in the next couple of minutes. If not, we can go to, well, it looks like Aaron has, I can see your face. You um, look like you want to ask a question. <laughs> I was, I've been out of the freshwater SAV world for a little while, but I was curious about our beverage, as, particularly with Valsneria, and if there's been any new research on, um, you know, like minimum size your exclosure would have to be before it can be a self-sustaining bed that's not just getting chomped up constantly. We've you know, we we were always able to get these beautiful Val mini beds established as long as they're protected. And the second there'd be a break in the exposure, it'll be gone within days. Um, so I was just curious if anyone is working on that. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I'm I'm thinking that my so I I use those really small enclosures, thinking, okay, I can produce these founder colonies, um, protect those, and then they can expand out of out of those um, fenced in areas. And that's so easy to deploy, they're flexible, something can just roll over them and they just pop right back up. And so I really like that. But um, it could be in marmal conditions that made my plantings unsuccessful, or it could also be that the fence the exposure was actually too small. So I work um, quite a bit with, with the, um, the District of Columbia DEC, um, and they also do some Valsinaria restorations, but they have these huge Mongo exclosures with PVC piping and all that. It takes a huge amount of effort just to put them out. And they're actually more successful. We sort of kind of work in the same area and they have in some areas, some really nice nice plants inside the exclosures. But as soon as you get outside, nothing. And so it's like, you can't fence your entire place. So mm -hmm. I'm actually, it's, I, yeah, I'm trying not to get frustrated and I'm I'm trying to figure out what to do here because as as I said, we we can't exclude, we can't fence the entire bay. Yeah. <laughs> so Becky said she's actually got a picture of one of those monster exclosures in her presentation. So we'll see a picture of one in a few minutes. All right. So well, I thank would add you one all. thing to the Valley oh, okay. scenario in terms of field collection. <laughs> And DNR and I have found out that if you don't get out there on time, the geese get it all. And we're finding that that's true with a number of different species. Redhead is kind of the same way. Um, nature knows when the seed is ripe and ready to go. Um, so we've actually, we get out to Vallisneri beds. We're not entirely sure whether or not it didn't produce that year or whether the geese got it first. <laughs> But yeah. um, that's a consideration for us when it comes to um, to our collection efforts is is trying to beat Mother Nature. It's either hurricanes or waterfowl that usually <laughs> goes in. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> this is why it might be. I mean, it's really advantageous to have volunteers and river keepers and waterkeeper groups, watershed groups out keeping an eye on things for you that you know. You can't be everywhere, so to have more eyes in the water so we know what's going on and when, when the seeds are ready is really important. So, okay, all right. Thank you both so much for presenting today, sharing your knowledge, sharing your information. It's hugely appreciated by all of us. Uh, hopefully you're gonna stick around uh, for the regulatory conversation and not regulatory exactly, but uh, the, the ins and outs of some regs that have to do with SAV restoration. So I think, so it's, according to my clock, it's 3.08. Um, why don't we take five minutes or so? Yeah, we're scheduled to come break. back, yep, at 3.15. And I'm launching a poll right now. This is based mm -hmm. on the, the top two next topics, potentially. So if everyone can just give us a quick vote 
Um, that's going to guide um, our next steering committee. We'll meet to finalize how we're going to approach the topic, and then we'll have our another quarterly meeting. So do that, and then go pee and come back at three fifteen. <laughs> Great, thanks everybody. <laughs>
Hazy, I'm going to, I've shared my screen. Can you see the presentation? I sure can. Oh, good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Brooke. Don't thank me yet. Let's see if I continue. <laughs> I was just saying, you didn't pick a random presentation. <laughs> I know. I'm disappointed. <laughs> yeah, we can mix it up. All right. It does look like it is the magic hour. I'm ending the poll or last second. Anyone? Anyone? Uh, and share the results resoundingly. We'll be talking about aquaculture and SAV interactions. So uh, steering committee, you'll be looking for emails from your triad here uh, as we arrange the steering committee meeting, and then you'll we'll have a follow-up with the uh, quarterly meeting information. So thanks for playing. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for putting that poll together, Z. No problem. Handy dandy. All right. Well, our... Well, it's 3.15, we're gonna get going. Our next presentation, a lot of us, um, you know, that are working in the SAV restoration realm have all sorts of questions about the regulatory aspects of uh, moving plants around and collecting plants, redeploying plants, seeds, the whole nine yards. And so one of my colleagues at Maryland DNR that specializes in, and also the vice chair of our SAV work group for the Chesapeake Bay program has, works way more in environmental review and the regulatory aspect of things than I do. And she has agreed to present on this very topic. So I introduce Becky Golden, <laughs> my esteemed colleague. Thank you so much for agreeing to present today, Becky. Yeah. And uh, I will turn it over to you. Just let me know when to advance slides and if anything goes wrong during the sure. advancement of the set slides, go for it. Thank you. Yeah. So can you put it in presentation mode for me, please? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So Zoom doesn't. Thank you. That's good. Okay. Zoom doesn't play well with my laptop, so I can have audio or visual, but I can't have both at the same time. So Brooke's going to be running my slides for me. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so you can just go to the next one, please. Um, so just wanted to thank the previous presenters. Um, they really had a lot of good background information that I think is going to be a good segue moving into my presentation and covers a lot uh, of the information um, that sort of is guiding the regulation, regulations and statutes that I'll be discussing today. Um, mainly covering you know, District of Columbia, Maryland and Virginia. So those states that have regulations for the tidal waters and portions of the Chesapeake Bay. So if there's anybody uh, that's on the call from Virginia or DC, please feel free to speak up if I'm missing anything for your jurisdiction or if I'm just completely lying about something. Um, so I'm gonna cover the regulations for both the collection of SAV material as well as transplanting material. Um, just quickly go over an example of the electronic data submittal and collection form that we use here in Maryland, as well as um, what a collection permit looks like for Maryland for SAV collection, and then covering a whole bunch of other things that you may want to consider, a lot of which we've already discussed previously in this meeting. Um, next slide, please. And then next slide. Thanks. Um, so all of DC, Maryland, and Virginia have some sort of regulation or law that pertains to the removal or collection of aquatic submerged vegetation within their jurisdiction. Um, so for DC and Maryland, it's a very vague um, regulation that deals with all kinds of removal, not just simply for the removal of plants or seeds for restoration. Virginia is a bit more specific, and so their regulations do deal with um, removal for restoration as well as transplanting. Um, it's pretty straightforward, the information that all of these jurisdictions require from an applicant or somebody that wants to remove SAV as well as to collect the seeds or plants. Um, you know, we're looking at contact information for the applicant, the homeowner, if it's somebody that wants to do something, on the, you know, the, the water in front of their waterfront property, as well as an organization, state agency, again, an academic institution, project information, you know, really looking for the justification. Why is removal of the plants or the seeds necessary? You know, your purpose of collection. 
um, location. I have a little asterisk by this one um, because it's slightly different for each of the jurisdictions. Um, we really wanna know where are you getting the materials from? Um, specifically, if you're harvesting seeds, um, now this isn't in Maryland regulations, but it is in Virginia regulations. We wanna make sure that you're collecting seeds um, from an area or a bed that's stable, persistent, and dense. Again, we're really relying on the VIMS annual survey for this information. Um, so Virginia is requiring that you know, the SAV beds that you're removing material from are um, a three to four density, which is a, a density class scale that VIMS uses for the survey. So you know, denser beds on the denser side. Um, you want them to be collected from a large bed. We had talked about that again, because you don't wanna, you wanna minimize the, the disturbance that you're having to those, those natural donor beds. Um, and you also wanna take care that you aren't doing any sort of secondary or you know, indirect impact to the bed itself, whether that's just through like repeated trampling through the bed, or if you are using a boat, you don't wanna be you know, dredging and you know, making prop scars all through the bed as you're actually collecting the material. Um, Maryland, it's again, it's very similar, although it's not required in the statute, though we do like you to harvest seeds from, again, beds that are at least five years old and have a, you know, a typical um, higher density class as mapped by VIMS. Um, again, we're looking at your collection or your harvesting method. You know, we prefer you to collect the seeds of the plants by hands or with a shovel. You know, we don't want people bringing back codes out there and just you know, using big construction equipment to remove the material. So that's important to know what, how you're gonna remove that material. Again, obviously what species, you know, some people are specifically looking at just one species. Other groups are more interested in doing a mix and a diversity of the species that they're collecting, as well as the extent of what you're removing. You know, that could be um, the number of shoots or seeds that you're collecting, the volume of material that you're collecting, or an estimate of a, a square meter or square footage of uh, area that you're gonna be collecting from. Again, the time frame. when are you interested in collecting this material? We, we talked about this, Michael touched upon that in his presentation about the ideal time to collect seeds when you know, they're right, nice and ready. So knowing the ideal time frame for the particular species that you're interested in is important. And so having you know, a, your best guess of when you would like to collect is good for then us regulatory agencies to then say, okay, this, you might want to change your, your time frame here a bit. Um, all right, if you go to the next slide, please. So this is the, the language specifically for Washington, DC. Again, it's more a, a broader uh, scale in terms of the harvesting, removal, or eradication eradication of SAV from any land. Um, it's from the tidal waters. So this again applies for tidal waters in DC. It does not apply to non-tidal waters. Um, the DOEE has a really good uh, informational section on their website that has instructions and guidance on what you would need. And they have an online portal that you would go in, create accounts, and then upload all your information and your collection request into there. Um, DC also um, states that you also may need a, a separate nationwide permit from the Army Corps of Engineers, um, depending on the scope of work that is uh, that you may be doing. Okay, next slide, please. Maryland, it's very similar. Again, a very vague general statute for any removal of SAV. Again, for tidal waters only, does not apply to non-tidal waters. Um, we also have an online submittal. It's uh, a really handy Google, Google form link that Caitlin uh, created for us. And again, it contains the detailed instructions and guidance that you would need um, to fill that out. And then this is also acts as your permit application through the, the Google form. Right, next slide, please. 
And then I mentioned Virginia um, has some very detailed regulations for uh, SAV harvesting that pertain more to the restoration aspect of SAV collection as well as planting. Um, for Virginia though, any request to remove SAV um, whether the, or to, to remove it or to plant it upon state bottom requires a joint permit application between the Virginia Marine Resources Commission and the Army Corps. And so they have a fillable PDF form online that you can fill out. And then there's an email that you, um, an email address that you send that to in terms of getting your application submitted. Okay, next slide, please. So then the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna show you their screenshots of what we use in Maryland to collect this information. Um, and so again, it's pretty straightforward in terms of the information that we're collecting from people because we really, you know, it's important in terms of not only the donor beds, um, timing, species, everything that we talked about earlier. Um, so again, we have uh, this Google form that we use. Again, there's a link to the actual statute text as to why we have the authority and what we need from the applicant in terms of our ability to issue a permit to collect SAV. So again, it's email, contact information. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. There's some project specifics. Again, we're looking at why, why are you removing SAV? You know, is it research, education? Is it mitigation? Is it a restoration? You know, other things such as that. Again, your objectives, goals, justification for why you're, you're wanting to remove the SAV or the plant material, the seed, so forth. And then the location of where you'll be removing it. Again, which species, you know, there's an option to pick one, to pick five, depending on what you're doing with your project. Um, and then we also have a little checkbox down here, basically making sure that the applicant is verifying that if they are harvesting SAV seeds, again, that they're collecting it from a dense, healthy, um, stable SAV bed. And then we also have another little checkbox that um, requires the applicant to um, submit a report based on, uh, that summarizes the results of their project to sort of keep them on the hook that people just aren't asking to collect seeds and then just randomly doing whatever they want with them and then there's no follow-up. Um, Yep, thank you. Next one. So for, once we have this information, um, most of, I would say most of the applications that we have are you know, partner agencies that we've been working with, uh, at least in Maryland. We don't have a lot of people that aren't working closely either with Anne Arundel Community College or University of Maryland or DNR that are really interested in, in doing these projects. So it is, you know, on my end, um, very helpful and easy to sort of take the information that's already been input um, into the, the Google form and then use that to, you know, create this permit and issue these permits to people. Um, so this is an example uh, specifically for Maryland for the SAV collection permit. So once we get that information, how do we use that to then permit those activities? So again, you know, as the permitting agency, we really have the ability to specify the time frame of collection. And this is again goes back to the importance of making sure that you know people are collecting, if you're collecting seeds, that we give them the optimal time frame to be collecting seeds from. You know, if you're looking at collecting plant material, making sure that the, the time frame is within that growing season for that specific species. Um, again, we can dictate what species and how much of that species people are, are um, allowed to collect, as well as how they're collecting it. So what method that they're using. Um, again, we can note the location of collection and then also uh, note any spatial or geographic restrictions that the people or the applicant may have. So for instance, for this permit, which I'm sure nobody can read because it's too small, um, this is for the Atlantic Coastal Bays. Um, and so we're asking that the applicant avoids any portion of the Assateague Island because it is a state park and a national seashore. Um, so we don't want any activities um, surrounding those areas because you know we're concentrating on the, the tidal waters of state-owned 
Maryland. Um, we're also, uh, you know, very important in terms of how uh, title and what um, that boundary between land and water. So again, we're always looking for people to collect um, below the mean high water mark. And then making sure that they're avoiding collecting anything that you know, may be in an aquaculture lease. So again, having that location of where they're interested in collecting is important, um, specifically if there are other shallow water activities that are occurring within that same location. Um, we also like to uh, prohibit bycatch and any duplicate harving, harvesting activities from occurring during the SAV collection. Again, you know, you're there to collect the SAV. We don't want you to be collecting all the little critters that live on that SAV um, or also, you know, harvesting crabs or something at the same time. So again, making sure that when you're out there collecting SAV, you're only collecting SAV. And we also uh, require, again, the annual report of activities. So keeping them on the hook to make sure that they are, you know, doing due diligence with the materials that the, they're collecting and making sure that they are, um, using that material for what they say they're using it for. Um, again, and then it's having a termination and a future denial clause within the permit is, is helpful in case somebody is, you know, doing some shady stuff out there that we don't want them doing. We're not going to issue you subsequent permits to, to harvest SAV if you can't follow the guidelines, which is pretty straightforward with any permit. All right, can you skip to the next one? Okay, so now I'm switching to you know, regulations that pertain to the actual restoration or the transplant of SAV plants or seeds. Um, as far as I know, um, in terms of the regulations for that between Maryland, DC and Virginia, only Virginia has regulations that pertain to the actual transplanting of material. And that, um, those regs are within the same code that covers the SAV collection. So again, like I said, they're very specific in Virginia code in terms of you can remove it and then you can put it out. Um, so again, you need an application from the MRC to do that, at least in Virginia, because they really want to evaluate, you know, success of your restoration activities. Um, making sure that you're minimizing the impacts to donor beds. And they wanna be able to track the progress of those projects and then learn from previous projects in terms of methodologies or site selection. Again, so they're looking for site coordinates, um, not only from your donor beds, but also where you're gonna be putting the seeds or the plant material out. You know, some sort of evidence that plant the planting site will likely support SAV beds. So is there SAV in the vicinity of where you're gonna be putting material, for example? Um, your transplant source, again, whether that's nursery stock or if you're getting material from a natural donor bed, your technique, how are you gonna transplant that? Again, and then the timing, are you doing this in the spring? Are you doing this in the fall? And then they also require a monitoring plan because once you put the material out, you know, making sure that um, we're actually monitoring and getting some data to, data from this to show that your your projects are successful or at least working, or that you can glean some you know lessons learned from them. Okay, next slide, please. And so while Maryland doesn't have any regulations that specifically allow or prohibit people to put SAV material back into the tidal waters of Maryland. We really do follow as closely as we can and sort of hope that people will follow our suggestions. And it's very similar to what um, Virginia has in their code. Um, again, so we're looking at, you know, could you please let us know where you're putting material out, um, you know, general water body or, you know, some GPS coordinates. Again, if you are transplanting or using actual plants, how are you putting them into the ground? Again, are you using burlap sacks? Is it just straight bare roots? Is it seeds? That sort of thing. And then again, requiring a monitoring plan. Um, so we like to see what is the frequency of your monitoring? Um, what's your method for monitoring? Are you gonna be actually in the field? Are you relying on them survey data? That sort of thing. And then the length of monitoring, how long are you gonna be monitoring these sites for? All right, next slide. 
Thank you. Um, and so I know Brooke put a link to this SAV restoration guide in the chat earlier, um, but this guide is super helpful and filled with so many best management practices that cover the whole swath um, from seed collection to monitoring for SAV restoration. And again, this uh, was compiled um, at the request of the SAV workgroup at the B program. And um, I think Brooke did mention in the, the chat message that you know, a lot of experts uh, were called in and provided a lot of good information for this restoration guide. So at least in Maryland, even though we don't have, uh, you know, regulations that particularly pertain to the seeding or the restoration of SAV, we really push this restoration guide because it has so many of those best management practices um, that we've discussed earlier in it um, in terms of, you know, site selection, for donor beds, Beth met messages for um, collecting seeds and plants, and then again, how do you disperse them, and then how do you monitor them? Uh, okay, and then, yeah, then the next slide, um, and of course, I did this presentation before I had a chance to listen to the earlier presenters, so as everybody was talking earlier, I'm furiously taking notes about everything else that we could be added into this slide. So this is definitely not all inclusive, bunch of stuff that I'm missing here. Um, but the, the main ones that I wanted to talk about were, you know, these are just the regulations that pertain to DC, Maryland, Virginia, um, but there may be other necessary authorizations that you may need. Um, we talked about, um, those exclosures, and this is the exclosure from uh, what DC uses, and I think this is one from the Potomac. Uh, this is a figure that came out of that restoration guide, and they describe it as a very robust exclosure setup. Um, so yeah, this this thing's massive. Um, I do believe they require uh, authorization from the Coast Guard because it is big and may be considered a hazard to navigation. Um, so you also need to consider about that. If you are, you know, putting plants out and you're going to be using some sort of exclosure, um, you may need additional authorization, whether it's federal or state, to put out um, these big structures. Uh, the other thing we talked about was disturbing the bottom. Um, so for Maryland, you know, DNR, we have the authorization for the SAV removal in terms of SA re removal. Once you start digging and you're removing the bottom, that changes to the Maryland Department of the Environment. And so that's covered under their title, wetlands regulations. So there is additional regulations that you may need to follow if it pertains to you disrupting the bottom. So, you know, looking into those state, again, and federal regulations um, that, could apply uh, depending on your collection method or your seeding or your planting method. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my notes here to see if I added anything to that from our discussion. Um, the other biggie is you know, the species and the source of plant material. Um, you know, for most of us, the species we're gonna be restoring are native species. Um, but there are cases where there's specific species listed that are considered, you know, aquatic invasive or noxious weeds. And there are both state and federal uh, regulations that prohibit the import or export of those plants across state lines. So again, we talked a little bit about that in terms of uh, climate change and changing habitat conditions and moving those plants and seed materials across state lines. So again, working with your regulatory folks to make sure that there aren't any restrictions or reservations between the two states or you know, jurisdictions um, that may warrant um, you from not bringing things in or you know moving things out. Um, and then after Katia was speaking, you know, we talked about for the most part, our regulations deal with um, beds in the bay. They don't deal with any nursery raised plants. Um, if that's the case, then those regulations are covered under our aquaculture group. And so I didn't touch upon those here. Um, but so really, you know, consider where you're getting your, your material from. Is it, um, you know, 
right down the river? Is it coming from a nursery that's within the watershed? Uh, we typically uh, suggest to people that they use you know, seed sources or, or donor beds, or if they're using nursery raised material, that it's coming from the watershed. We don't want people purchasing something on Amazon and then you know dumping it out in the bay. Though, depending on what Katia finds, maybe that would be the best bet genetically if, if we do use you know some genetically diverse plants. So I do think that that is a, you know, a, a science gap and some questions that we definitely can take a look at in terms of uh, some restoration research. Um, oh, you also want to consider other permitted activities. You know that near shore uh, land water interface is really busy. We know that there's other things happening, you know, as you just put up the poll about SAV interactions with aquaculture or with living shorelines. Um, you want to avoid overlap with those other permanent activities. You don't want to, you know, come up with this great SAV restoration site and then realize, oh, crap, somebody just built a pier through it or we're filling it because we're making a living shoreline. So I think it's really important to have the regulatory folks of your jurisdiction sort of talking or at least linking, you know, goes back to that electronic tracking. So we have a list of where we want to put seeds out. You know, does this overlap with some existing aquaculture leases or some proposed leases? So really having, you know, some sort of tracking or communication among groups. So everybody's sort of on the same page in terms of where, where the shallow water use uh, you know, uses are happening. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more other things to consider and everybody will have questions in a few minutes about that. But um, that is all I have right now. Great, right, thank you, Becky. Yeah, there is a, there's a question in the chat uh, from Tay. What do you do with the application info? Is it in a database or mapped or how's it used? Sure, so right now, um, you know, the handy thing with using Google Forms is on the back end, it creates that spreadsheet for you. So, um, you know, that's the database that we have right now. And so all the information that gets you know, put into that online form then gets spit out on the back end for our database. Um, and then again, that information is used to, um, I guess, just inform us again, in terms of where is, I guess, the most interest in restoration, as well as where is the most interest for seed collection or plant material collection. So it really helps us to sort of minimize any disruption of donor beds, because we can see like, oh, okay, three groups want to want to harvest from this area. Why don't we wait and hold off on giving a permit to that, you know, that fourth group that wants to harvest from, from this group or um, the same thing with with um, putting the seeds and the materials out. Again, having those locations um, to verify that there's no overlap. At this point, um, you know, honestly, for me in Maryland, we don't have that many requests for SAV collection. And so, you know, just being able to look at that list really quickly and then sort of you know, superimposing that with, you know, a map of the other other permitted um, actions that are happening is enough. But I do see, you know, in the future having, you know, that information in a map where it can be, you know, overlapped in, spatially on a, in a map to make sure that there aren't any of those overlaps. I was going to ask that question, how many applicants you normally get? And if they're in the academia realm or mitigation realm or what that looks like? I would say it's pretty evenly split among academia for, re for research. So we're moving plants because they're looking at a, a, you know, some sort of study on those plants. Um, mitigation, we've had a lot more um, SAV mitigation required for projects in Maryland within the past few years and they're, you know, they're in-kind mitigation. So that would be equally split, I think, with the, the academic uh, research requests. And then, um, you know, as Chris and Michael talked about, we have a lot of our sort of partnership, at least in Maryland, where we're, we're doing the seed uh, collection and, and transplant and seeding on that end. We don't have a lot of um, other folks that aren't working directly with us that are doing that. So um, I would say anywhere between 
three and seven requests a year for the past few years, definitely less than 10 a year from Maryland. Thanks. Katie, you had your hand up? Yeah, thanks. Um, realizing my video was not. Uh, we, this was a really helpful presentation because we're doing, we're starting to do a similar look at the existing regulatory framework in Connecticut and New York um, for Long Island Sound. And what we're finding is that related to eelgrass, while there is an existing regulatory framework that provides some, you know, kind of guidance, a lot of the eelgrass related things that are for more of the emerging topics are just kind of policies or what you, I think, refer to in your presentation as suggestions. Um, and so I'm wondering how the states that you've looked at document the policies related to eelgrass or these suggestions, I guess, that you referred to. Um, are they written anywhere or is it just taken as a case by case basis with these kinds of permit reviews? So I would say here in Maryland, we have a lot of smaller working groups or coordination meetings between the state and federal agencies that are looking at the, those particular, I guess, topics. So we have one that was looking at living shoreline permitting and how those procedures to issue the permits may impact SAV. Um, there is one that uh, was done similarly for shellfish aquaculture. Again, looking at those specific policies or procedures that the reviewers are using to either issue or deny a permit. Um, I think this kind of segues into the next discussion because we did the same thing for the Bay where we did a regu regulatory review of just you know all the general laws and regs that applied to anything that may have direct or indirect impacts on SAV. And that's what we found, you know, most of the regulations out there are really, you know, restrictive and pro protect SAV. It's when you get into that nitty gritty permit approval process and the procedures that the different uh, regulatory agencies are using, that's where there's some, some wriggle room, I would suggest. And so having these collaborative meetings between the regulators and like the, the natural resource agencies um, to sort of discuss the, the sticking points um, has been really helpful because there has been some movement in terms of how things are being reviewed or when like the NUST general permit for the Army Corps is coming out, like our suggestions can then sort of be tweaked in the, the next revisions for um, like our nation, not our nation but our general permits for living shorelines um, or just, you know, really talking amongst the groups has been super helpful, I guess. I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, that's helpful. So it doesn't sound like the policies are necessarily documented. It's more of like a discussion that happens with every potential project that would come. Yeah. Yeah, from, from what I've been involved in, the, the those procedures aren't written. It's just as, you know, this is this is what we use. We use a five-year look back. It's not documented that we have to, but that's that's yes. what we use. And those will be easier to implement in terms of new new policies versus new regulations. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. So those those working groups, I'm guessing, are going to be really valuable from that perspective. So yeah, I have found yeah. them to be. You have a question in the chat, Becky, from Jill, about our best practice document and uh, whether we provide collection guidelines, if you want to speak to that a bit. I will. And please help me out here, Brooke, because you also have more involvement with that guidance document. Um, I think it's really case by case in terms of when we're issuing a permit where we could we could specify that in the permit but that gets back to for most cases these aren't large-scale collections um, and so it's only a few plants or you know in some cases a few thousand or maybe a million seeds from an area um, so we don't specifically have any documentation on you know a a spacing because it's really case by case. Um, but I know that the 
that guidance document does have some language in there about reducing the strain on the donor beds. And it gets back to just, you know, best management practices, making sure you're, you know, you're, you're moving around out there and, and collecting from different areas and everybody's spread out, um, but nothing specifically in documentation. Although I think in your presentation, the permit that you showed did have a limit, at least on the number of seeds that could be. Collected yes. Or yeah. So there's definitely. Plant. Yeah. So it, and again, that goes back to that limit. If it's just, you know, a few plants or a few hundred seeds, um, you may not need to to request them to space it out. But if they're looking at more of a larger scale collection, then, yes, that would be something to consider where you're having a minimum number or a maximum number of shoots per square meter that you could specify. And you have another one, yeah. another question. Yeah, so what does permitting look like for implementing projects with SAV? Are there any sub aqueous permits needed for seeding planting? Or not for Can you elaborate? Care? I'm sorry. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So um, I was just wondering if, if you had like, so if you want to go plant SAV in Maryland or, you know, in the Chesapeake Bay, um, you know, whether it's putting out seeds or direct planting, do, is there anywhere, that, um, I don't know how it works there. Do you have to fill out a permit with your like subaqueous, like fill out a land lease to do that or um, like go buy subaqueous permitters? Um, just because in Delaware, um, we're having a lot of conversations with our permitters about, um, you know, potential projects coming in. And I want to just be as informed as I can be about what I, everyone else in the area is doing. Um, and that's one of the topics is um, filling out subaqueous permits for SAV work. So I believe that may be the case in Virginia, but Maryland's all bottom is state owned. And so while we do have like leases issued for shellfish uh, aquaculture, we don't issue leases for SAV. So again, this is just, it's still gonna be state owned lands um, that you would be putting material out on. So there's nothing stopping anybody from putting seeds and material out, at least in tidal waters of Maryland, um, just because of how we define the bottom in terms of state owns. And I know that is different in other jurisdictions in terms of public and private lands. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So one thing I think I might share, if I can do it without um, taking too long, is that, so Z referenced this earlier, and we've been talking about this. So we we did this, you know, review of statu statutes and regulations in Chesapeake Bay and, and anything that might impact SAV. And we had talked about as the collaborative wanting to expand this table, like the, the review document uh, included an Excel file full of the exact language, all the statutes and regulations spelled out, searchable database. And it'd be, I think it'd be fantastic to do this for the entire East Coast. It might be a pretty big lift, um, but I think if we can get the steering committee involved and in working on this, it'll be a nice um, document and resource for everybody. So I'm going to pull that up just to show it to you, but it is also on our um, information page on our website, which is eastcoastsabcollaborative.com. And I put the regulatory review in the um in the chat, that's actually just a link to the page that has it on, so you can like additionally click on it. The Excel file uh, database is on the same page right under it. So just, you know, when you have a minute, look at it in a little bit more detail. It's got like language that you might wanna borrow if you're working on putting together uh, regulations and statutes. And uh, so let me, let me stop talking for a second and share that. Well, and one of our original goals for the collaborative today was to talk about how to start filling this in. So I think it'd be a good idea to meet meet with the steering committee or have that the steering committee kind of push that out to each of the states and figure out where we're, I know in New Jersey, you know, where we're lacking and how we can populate that. Definitely. So can you see this? Am I adequately yes. sharing? Okay. Yes. 
<laughs> very tiny, tiny <laughs> font, but yes. Oh, true. Let me blow it up a little bit. Um, okay, so as you can see across the bottom of the database, you know, we've got all the data in one tab, and then we break it out by state. So we could do something similar, just, you know, add states to this document. Uh, and then we've got, you know, drop downs on what type of law it is, whether it's a, a guidance, a regulation, a statute, et cetera. Uh, you know, we can do keyword search. Uh, in this case, we've got removal, uh, we've got aquaculture, all sorts of things in this um, in this column that we can check off as a keyword that we want to search. The actual name of the, the citation, the agency that's in charge of it, the title of the regulation or statute, a short summary of what it includes, and then the actual text of you know the regulation or statute. So there's a lot of information in here that um, that we refer to all the time. It's very handy, and I think I'm going to stop sharing. Just get disconcerted when I can't see you all. Um, I think that would be like you know we should do this for sure. Uh, you know, in all of our spare time. But yeah, we, <laughs> we're not, I don't, you know, it's uh, 3.55 now. We're supposed to pull the plug on this at four. So we're not going to work on this now. But we will, like Z said, continue to work with the steering committee. I think one of the next things we'll do is actually get a steering committee meeting on the books uh, for the next month or two. Um, we'll send out a doodle poll or a when to meet and get that scheduled. I think we've got steering committee representation from every state now. So thank you everybody who's volunteered to serve on the steering committee. And uh, yeah, that'll be one of the next things we do. I totally jumped ahead and did not thank Becky adequately for your presentation. So thanks Becky for putting that awesome information together. I think it's, uh, it'll be well used throughout this group. So. And again, I've got the presentation, and if you give me permission, I will put it online, or Caitlin will put it online. Uh, do you have anything else you want to add to any of that, Z? No, I think on the agenda, we just wanted to leave time for any partner updates. We plan to include oh, yeah. that in our meetings. Yeah. Just anything that's going on in your, your crew, your team, your research, anything that you want to share with the group before we adjourn? I know quite a few of us were on some big NOAA proposals that went in, any projects you're working on that you want to share. So that's really just it. I could jump in again um, to share that Delaware has um, started a Delaware statewide specific SAV group. Um, and our kickoff meeting is next week. Um, Brittany Haywood um, with Delaware Sea Grant and I are going to be the co-chairs of that. So just nice. some exciting news coming out of Delaware um, that we are getting more involvement in the SAV world. <laughs> so. Yay. Awesome. Yeah. And definitely we can post that underneath the Delaware info on the website. I had a question for the Delaware folks. Uh, I was working last year with a gentleman named Andrew McGowan, and he's with the Delaware Center for the Inland Bays. And I don't know whether any of you know Andrew, but he put <laughs> together a turbulator in Delaware. Yeah. So if any of you are aware of that, I would love to hear how all that went. Yeah. So yeah. I see Taylor pop. Yep. Yeah, Taylor popped on. She is stepping into Andrew's place doing that. And um I was also and Brittany Haywood, we all were a part of the building of the turbulator. Um, it is the first turbulator in Delaware, and I think the third one in the region with with Maryland. I think that statistics out there somewhere. So, yeah, Taylor, <laughs> go, go ahead. Taylor's taking the reins with that. Yeah, so we got to use it last summer to process um, wood and grass seed um, that was collected in Little Assawoman Bay. Um, right now, we have those seeds sitting in a fridge, very similar to how you keep yours in 30 PPT water. Um, and I've been running viability and germination experiments since we've collected it. We've done some suitability monitoring following that period, trying to figure out exactly where we can put it in the inland bays in Delaware. So that's about where we're at with it, but we're looking to use it again this upcoming summer again. So how did it go? How did it run? It ran pretty well. I was very new into SAV at the time when um, they got it up and running. So it was 
definitely an experience to see it work but honestly <laughs> it seemed to have run really well we got a decent amount of seed out of it from what we collected so that was good nice yeah i lost andrew's name so i've spent the last 15 minutes <laughs> rummaging through emails to find <laughs> his name but I, I saw some delaware folks here i thought i'd ask well that's, yeah, he's, that's he's in the collaborative michael he's just now actually in new jersey mm -hmm. oh, okay <laughs> Well, good luck with that, Taylor. Thank you. I'll <laughs> probably reach out at some point to pick your brain on turbulator use too. Yeah, I'm 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 all ears. Awesome. So Katie asked a question in the chat um about Connecticut. No, it keeps bouncing around. Uh information. Oh, adding new tabs. New yeah, yeah. Um, well, Becky and I both have the original document, uh, so feel free to get in touch with either one of us, or you've all got my email. Um, we can put Becky's in the chat as well. Uh, actually, Becky, if you'll write it. So one thing that I wanted to mention also is that uh, Tay and I have been talking about potentially adding math the Massachusetts Seagrass Group information to our East Coast SAV Collaborative website and housing uh, their information on our site. And I think we're, we're still in the works to do that. So it kind of opened up the possibility and just the idea of if there are other small groups forming that need web space and don't have web space, um, we are definitely open to the possibility, the idea of, you know, putting everything on our East Coast Collab website, you can have your own tab um, or whatever they're called, not tabs, but your own page on our website. So I think that would be make everything really easy, getting everything in the same space. If you're interested in doing that, let us know. Um, and yeah, we can talk about it. I think it, it'll be a nice, easy resource. Assuming, Che, that you still want to do that, <laughs> of course. We can't hear you. <laughs> hey, Thanks, there you Brooke. are. <laughs> I, yeah, um, that's going to be really helpful. And we're starting to develop content here to give to you. So, yeah, thanks a lot for that. It, it seemed like the perfect place to nest our, our um, you know, regional, our state group in your regional um, collab site. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we're Kayla, you could certainly do that for your Delaware group, you know, if, if you, that gets going. So that's thinking. Yeah. Thanks. We're we're hosting it as of now under our um, Delaware Restoration Work Group is kind of a subcommittee, um, which will be having a web page in the near future. Um, but that is also something to consider maybe if we expand from that. So definitely good to know. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And we can always just link to it as well. So this is more if you're starting a group, you don't feel like paying for your own web space or starting your own web page. <laughs> so all right. Well, it's 4.02. So we're two minutes over. And this has been a fabulous meeting. Very informative. I, I'm really excited about the future of SAV restoration along the East Coast and just globally. All sorts of things are happening. So I look forward to working with you all in the future. Hopefully everybody that applied for that NOAA funding for restoration gets it. And uh, we'll have lots of opportunities for collaboration. So. Great. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thanks. We'll see y'all soon.